Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this, the 10th meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2014. Uh, as usual, can I ask everyone to make sure that their mobile phones and electronic devices are switched off, please? We have a busy meeting today, so I hope to keep uh, to time this morning and ensure that we have enough time to consider all of our agenda items, the first of which is a decision on taking uh, business in private, um, taking the committee's agreement to uh, take agenda item six in private. Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay. That brings us to agenda item two. The second item of business is an evidence session on the research that the committee published yesterday on the local impact of welfare reform. As a follow-up to research the committee published in April 2013 on the impact of welfare reform in Scotland, the committee commissioned further research from the Centre for Regional Economic and Social Research at Sheffield Hallam University to look at the imp impact at a local authority ward level. Uh, I'd like to welcome the author of the research, Professor Steve Fothergill, to provide a presentation of his findings to the committee. Uh, welcome to you, Professor, and I'll hand over to you if you want to make some introductory comments. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a presentation. I was intending to speak for perhaps about a um, quarter of an hour, if that's fine, um, and, and then I assume you would want to um, uh, fire a few questions. Um, firstly, um, let me say this is actually a joint effort. It's myself and uh, Christina Beatty at, um, at Sheffield Hallam. Um, uh, let me also say by way of introduction uh, that as uh, last time I've not come here to try to pass judgment on the welfare reforms. I think that's uh, your business. Um, what my job is, is to try and tell it as it is and to, uh, to trace through uh, in a very hard, honest, objective way um, the impact of the reforms introduced by Westminster, uh, trace through the impact uh, on Scotland as a whole, on local authorities and on individual uh, local areas within those authorities. Um, the background, um, yes, uh, this is the second time um, I've been in front of this committee. We, uh, uh, we did come here um, with a report, I think, in, in April of last year, uh, which was the first to try and systematically document uh, the overall impact of the uh, reforms on Scotland, uh, generating figures for the impact of each of the individual elements of the reform package. And for the first time, we produced... Um, estimates for each individual uh, local authority up here. Uh, the new report is very, very much uh, a, a further step on from that original uh, document. Um, it does uh, modestly update the overall Scottish figures. I'll come on to that in a moment. But I suppose the key uh, thing that it does, the, the real innovation here, is that we've generated new estimates for the first time uh, for each electoral ward uh, across uh, the whole of Scotland. There are 353 individual electoral wards here, uh, and we've got a figure for each one of those. Um, there were also a few comments in the report about the impact on particular types of households and individuals. That's something I know there was quite a lot of interest in last time, but we didn't really uh, address in any uh, significant way. Um, the reforms that we're looking at, uh, they should be familiar to you uh, by now. There are eight uh, in total that this particular um, exercise uh, covers. If we had been doing this in England, it would have been a list of ten. But, of course, um, there are... Um, uh, you've put in place measures, haven't you, now, in, in, in Scotland uh, to avert the impact of at least two of, uh, of the reforms that are impacting in England. Um, uh, the housing benefit under occupation rules, which in shorthand terms I'll call the bedroom tax. I know not everybody likes that term, but I think it's, it's well understood. Uh, you've got arrangements now in Scotland that avert the impact on, uh, on claimants. And uh, right from the off, you've had um, uh, arrangements uh, that have averted the impact of the reduction in council tax uh, benefit grant from Westminster um, that is not being passed on to, um, to claimants. Um, it's been absorbed, I understand, within you know, various public sector budgets up here. Uh, universal credit's not in the package. It wasn't in the package that we looked at last time round because it's qualitatively different. Essentially, it's a repackaging of uh, existing measures. 
Um, the transfer of, of loan parents from income to support to JSA doesn't actually lead to any net reduction in their benefit entitlement. And the RPI to CPI change is really not just a welfare reform, but something more general across the um, whole of uh, the public sector. Um, I've got to go through this boring bit. It's um, how we go about uh, measuring the impact of the, uh, the reforms. I suppose the key point to log is that everything that I'm going to present in terms of hard edge numbers is ultimately deeply rooted in, in the Treasury's own estimates of the overall financial savings. Um, we also draw very heavily on, on the Westminster government's um, impact assessments and indeed also on the benefit claimant numbers and expenditure authority by authority um, across Britain. Uh, the crucial step in moving from the level of local authority statistics right down to the level of electoral wards is that we bring uh, benefit numbers and, and figures on benefit expenditures um, uh, right down at the local level, actually at the data zone level, uh, into, uh, into the package. And that allows us to, to make that transition right the way down from the Treasury's overall estimates uh, through figures for Scotland and its constituent authorities uh, right down to electoral uh, ward level. Um, having said all of that, you must bear in mind that um, the figures that we present are ultimately estimates. Uh, there is a margin of error um, on them all, um, but I wouldn't uh, anticipate them being fundamentally uh, wrong. I think this is a soundly based procedure that we've followed. And still on the, uh, on, on the boring bits, I've got to go through all the health warnings, um, I'm afraid. Uh, you do need to bear in mind that some of the reforms target households uh, and others target individuals. Housing benefit reforms clearly target households as a whole. Uh, changes to incapacity benefit entitlements are about the entitlements of individuals. And some individuals and some households are hit by more than one element of the package. However, almost exclusively the impact is on uh, working age claimants. There's very little impact at all uh, falls on uh, people of above state uh, pension uh, age. And so a lot of what we do when we present the figures is to present the figures in terms of the impact per adult of working age. Um, we also uh, look at the impact when the reforms are fully implemented and the time scale on which uh, different elements of the package come to full fruition does vary. Um, in particular, I would draw your attention to the fact that there's still an awful lot in the pipeline happening now or scheduled to happen around disability uh, benefits, entitlement to ESA, entitlement to DLA, or indeed its replacement uh, PIP. And finally, on the, on the boring bits, I'm afraid, uh, let me say that we hold everything else constant. We're not making any assumptions here about the consequences of the welfare reforms for employment levels here in Scotland or across uh, the United Kingdom uh, as a whole. Right, uh, let's work down from the Scottish figures uh, eventually down to the, uh, to the ward level statistics. Um, these are a slightly revised version of the figures we presented in April last year uh, for the impact of the reforms uh, on Scotland as a whole. Now that we know that the bedroom tax, has, uh, its impact has been averted on, on claimants, we were able to take that out of the jigsaw. Uh, we also have harder edge numbers on the impact of the overall household uh, benefit cap, and that's a little bit down on what was originally anticipated. But overall, once the reforms have... Um, uh, have come to full fruition, we're looking at um, 1.6 billion, 1,600 million pounds a year uh, being taken out of uh, Scotland uh, by the uh, welfare reforms. Uh, that financial loss here in Scotland averages 460 pounds uh, per adult uh, of working age uh, per year. Um, that figure is pretty much in line with the GB average, I've got to say. We're not on about Scotland being hit any harder or uh, less hard uh, than Britain as a whole. Uh, but when you look at the detailed uh, look, regional figures, as we did in the uh, report last year, actually Scotland escapes 
uh, rather more likely than Wales, rather more likely than Northern England or London, um, but is hit uh, significantly harder than large parts of Southern uh, England. Uh, the impact by local authority, again, this is, these are rev revised figures, uh, a revised version of the figures that we presented uh, last year. Uh, big differences between individual authorities um, up and down uh, the length and breadth of Scotland. Uh, we identified uh, Glasgow as being the hardest hit place. Um, on the uh, slightly tweaked figures here, yes, it remains the, the hardest hit place but through to at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, Aberdeenshire and, and Shetland. Among the harder hit places, um, the, the older industrial areas of the central belt uh, figure uh, very uh, strongly indeed, and that's consistent with a wider pattern across uh, the United Kingdom where it's older industrial areas with large numbers of benefit claimants uh, that really are uh, in the firing line from the welfare uh, reforms. Now, let's get on to the, the new stuff. Uh, the impact uh, by ward across uh, Scotland. Uh, this is a list of what we identify as being the uh, 20 hardest hit electoral wards uh, across Scotland as a whole. Um, at the very, very uh, top of that list is Calton in, in, in Glasgow, uh, where we estimate an overall financial loss of £880 per adult of working age per year once the reforms have come to full fruition. You look down that list of the worst hit 20 and you'll see that there are a dozen uh, Glasgow wards. Uh, the balance is made up by uh, wards in a number of other um, older industrial areas, uh, Dundee, uh, Fife, uh, Inverclyde, uh, Western Barton, uh, Renfrewshire, uh, etc. At the other end of the spectrum, these are the, uh, the ten wards that we think are least affected um, by the, uh, the reforms in terms of the financial losses. Um, very different geography here. Uh, Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire uh, account for five um, of the least affected uh, ten. Um, right at the very bottom of the list, the least affected part of Scotland, uh, we estimate to be St Andrews in Fife. Uh, one of my colleagues at uh, Sheffield Hallam rather cheekily suggested that you're probably more likely to be hit by a golf ball uh, than by the welfare reforms if you live in, uh, in, in St Andrews. Um, in uh, the report last year, we looked at the relationship between the impact of the reforms and deprivation at the level of local authorities. This does the same exercise at the level of electoral wards. Each one of those dots, and there are 353 of them, is an electoral ward. You don't need to be able to read the scale and the details to, um, uh, measures on here, but the vertical scale is, is the um, hit in each of the wards measured in terms of the loss per adult of working age per year. Uh, the bottom scale um, measures deprivation from the Scottish indices of, of, of deprivation. And you can see um, that there's a very clear uh, relationship there. Uh, broadly speaking, the, uh, the higher the level of uh, deprivation, uh, the higher the financial hit arising uh, from the welfare reforms. And that is a pattern that we identified um, in the report last year at the level of local authorities. It's not an entirely unsurprising uh, pattern because, you know, where are uh, welfare benefit, benefit claimants, welfare benefit recipients concentrated? They tend to be concentrated in the poorer areas. That's one of the things that defines areas um, as being uh, poorer. I'll just show you uh, four maps to, to illustrate what's there. In the report, there is a map for each of your 32 uh, local authorities and statistics uh, for every single uh, ward. Um, this is the, uh, the, the map by ward in Glasgow. Um, 
I've noted already that Glasgow is hit particularly hard, and therefore you'll see there are large chunks of Glasgow shaded in, in dark blue, which is where the intensity of the hit is, uh, is, is greatest. Um, Edinburgh, it's a more uh, mixed picture, and um, there's a very interesting block there in the centre of the city where the, uh, uh, the hit is, is, is really quite modest. Um, we always used to talk, or certainly the academic literature used to talk about economic and social problems as being located in inner urban areas. Um, that is certainly not the case um, in, in Edinburgh, where the inner urban area is clearly escaping um, particularly lightly uh, here, and it's some of the more peripheral bits of the, of the city that are hit hardest. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, here's, here's Aberdeen, Aberdeen City. Uh, you'll notice there's not very much dark blue or even uh, middle uh, blue on that. Um, that's because Aberdeen uh, does not have large numbers of, of benefit claimants and uh, accordingly is not hit hard by the uh, reforms. And finally, just by way of illustration, there is Fife. Uh, considerable uh, diversity uh, within uh, Fife. I've already flagged up uh, that uh, white area on the uh, right-hand side, uh, that is uh, St Andrews, um, but there's a considerably uh, dark blue area uh, there in the, uh, in the middle of Fife, uh, particularly in the former coalfield area. The report also um, makes one or two comments about who is uh, being affected most by the reforms, as opposed to which areas are uh, most affected. Um, I will just uh, whip very, very quickly through this slide and the, and the following one. Uh, this, they're just there to illustrate the sorts of groups in the, uh, in the population that are most exposed uh, to each of the individual reforms. What you need to note, perhaps, when you just scan down this, this slide and the next one, is how often low income or disability or older people um, uh, tend to, um, older working age people uh, tends to be um, uh, flagged up. Um, what you also need to remember is that these reforms are happening simultaneously so that some groups in the population are being hit at the same time by more than one element of the reforms and that is particularly true I think of the incapacity benefit claimants. You need to bear in mind that the reforms to incapacity benefit are the big, in terms of the financial losses, are the biggest single element of the overall uh, package. Often the people who lose out on the changes to incapacity benefit will be the same people who are losing out from changes uh, to disability living allowance. Uh, they may also be losing uh, some housing benefit in, if they live in the private rented sector or if they've got a grown-up child still living at home, then they'll be losing out because of the reforms to uh, non-dependent uh, payments. Uh, they'll also be losing out, of course, through the 1% uh, operating rather than operating uh, with inflation. So to, to conclude... Um, uh, the variation in the impact of, of the reforms is, is substantial between wards. Uh, it's actually uh, greater than the variation between whole authorities. That's exactly what you'd expect to find because the diversity um, at the level of wards is much greater than the diversity at the level um, of, of local authorities. That's the diversity in terms of underlying socioeconomic conditions. Uh, broadly speaking, the worst affected wards are hit around four times harder on a per capita basis uh, than the least affected wards. Um, it's the deprived wards that are being hit hardest. And that um, unless there is some uh, a great revival in employment and labour market engagement as a result of the reforms, it would seem that the gaps in income and living standards between local communities, between local neighbourhoods, are set to rise. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, again, very uh, helpful um, report and something I think that we will all value and, and people beyond uh, the Parliament will value the, the work that you've done in, in identifying where the, the, the issues are affecting people. I don't suppose it was a, a complete surprise that the, the link up between deprivation and, and no. the hardest hit. So I think what we're actually looking at is, is the amounts and 
what the impact of that is. Uh, one question, just for clarification for myself. Have you done a similar uh, assessment of local ward areas in England? Or uh, is that just an overview in England? Uh, not yet. We, we, at the same time as we did the local authority work last year uh, that we presented up, up here, we did do a, a, a local authority-wide analysis um, in, in England. So we did have the full comparisons available so that we you know we know how Glasgow for example compares with other big cities uh, in England and indeed um, in, in Wales we haven't uh, done uh, the same exercise by ward across the whole of England in fact we've been piloting the methods up here uh, in, in, in Scotland we are about to apply the same methods uh, in Wales and in the Sheffield area and and in Northern Ireland actually yeah. um, but you know, the, the, the number of wards explodes away. You know, instead of dealing with 353, you're dealing with yeah. several thousand, and it becomes a, a, an immense task. But if, but if I read you right from uh, your initial comments, it would be difficult to do a comparison between, say, Carlton and the worst affected area in England because there are two uh, impacts that will be taken into account in England which won't reflect in here. Yeah. Um, I should perhaps have mentioned, and it is mentioned in the text of the report, that um, all the figures for Scotland are a little bit lower than otherwise would be the case. You know, if you hadn't put in, the, in place the arrangements for the bedroom tax and for council tax benefit, then the overall hit to Scotland would have been about £35 a head higher. Um, the hit to claimants in Scotland would have been about £35 a head higher. Um, uh, than is actually the case. And that would put Scotland a little head, ahead of the, uh, of, the, of the GB average, but still, I've got to say, uh, behind some of the worst-hit regions uh, in Britain. Um, and, and, and Glasgow, uh, even though we're, we're talking about a hit now of £620 per adult of working age, um, that, that's high by British standards. Um, I think the highest... Across Britain, we, we did identify was in Blackpool, of all places, where it was 900 across the... Uh, 910, I think, across um, the Blackpool borough um, as a whole. So, so Glasgow's grim on these numbers, and Carlton is, Carlton, Carlton is particularly grim, but um, uh, there are one or two worse places. Yeah. Okay. I'll open it up to the committee and go to Alex first, followed by Jamie. Yeah, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, I was going to start off a down a road we've been on before, but I was going to try to come to a, a slightly different conclusion and question at the end of it. The, of course, the, the figures you've produced uh, in terms of overall government policy are, in effect, only one side or one part of a balance sheet. And there are other government policies, such as the, the significant increase in the tax threshold, that do increase uh, the amount of money available to those uh, who are uh, basic rate taxpayers. Now, the, that, first of all, how do, you, how do you see that resource balancing out? Right. Well, I mean, there's clearly a lot going on simultaneously in the world. There's not only, you know, the welfare reforms, but there's, there's wider tax changes. There's, there's, there's the growth in, in, in the economy. Uh, there is the difference between, um, you know, the increases in prices and the increases in wages. Um, I mean, all we've really been able to do here is look at one element of the jigsaw. Um, I absolutely accept that. You know, there, there is a lot going on simultaneously as well that, that's not here. We're not trying to monitor the overall well-being of, um, uh, of, of individuals or of areas. We're trying to just simply to measure the impact on particular places of a particular set of, of, of policies. Is it so I then, accept your point. Yeah. Is it then the case that if, for example, we were to break down the impact of other policy changes on a similar basis, that it may actually result in these figures being somewhat, somewhat misleading. Let me qualify that. The, insofar as if we took the full balance of policies, could it actually mean that the differences are more extreme, or does it affect the pattern overall? It's, it's very difficult for, for, for me to comment on that, and, and I think because I don't think you know, we haven't got the, the hard evidence, we haven't done the, uh, done the calculations. Um, there is always a danger that even if we added in more, if we added in you know, changes in tax thresholds, people would then turn around to us and say, ah, well, you've not allowed for the fact that prices are rising faster than wages. You know, where do you stop in, in, in this exercise? Um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, what we've stopped at is just looking very specifically at 
uh, the impact of the, of the reforms. And it's very, very hard in the absence of the calculations to, to give you the definitive answer on, on some of the wider issues. Thank you. Amy? Thank you, Camille. Can I thank you for your uh, report, uh, Professor uh, Fogg. I think a lot of people find it very uh, helpful in understanding what's happening. I don't suppose it is particularly. I wasn't surprised to find you know, three of the wards in the area I represent are above average and one was <laughs> below average. It wasn't a surprise to me, but certainly it's very useful to have it quantified. So I'd like to thank you for that. Can I, you, you picked up on the uh, issue I wanted to explore, I wanted to explore it a little further. You've made the point that if uh, certain reforms had been put in place uh, here in relation to council tax benefit and uh, the bedroom tax that the uh, scale of loss would have been £35 higher uh, per working age adult than is otherwise the case would have actually been above the uh, UK average. So you've already said that, but can you quantify the, the split between the two measures, please? Um, yeah, let, 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 let's take the impact of the bedroom tax, um, because I've got to confess that um, I was really quite unaware until a late stage when we were doing this that you had put in um, place measures to avert the impact of, of, of the bedroom tax. So the figures that are up on your screen at the moment, um, you know, for the, for the overall impact by ward, we did calculate a, uh, a, a set of figures comparable to those in, that actually included the bedroom tax and then had to go back and take the bedroom tax out of the overall jigsaw. So I do know exactly what the, the bedroom tax does to those particular statistics. Uh, and in the worst hit wards, um, the Caltons, the Springburns, the North East Glasgow's, the Drum Chapels, um, the, the measures you put in to avert the bedroom tax take about £30 uh, per adult of working age per year off, the, off those numbers. So Calton would have been coming in at around about 910 rather than 880, and, and Springburn at 810 rather than 780, etc., etc. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, if I just went on to, to, to those figures of the least hit places, um, uh, the measures uh, that have been put in place to avert the impact of the bedroom tax really make very, very little impact on the, uh, the places least affected by the, uh, by the welfare reform. So there's virtually no impact, I think, on, on the statistics for, um, for St Andrews down at the very, very bottom of the list. And I suppose none of this is surprising because, you know, the, the, uh, uh, where is social housing concentrated? It tends to be in, in the poorer communities where there are large numbers um, uh, claiming ho housing benefit. Um, the social housing is not concentrated in, in, in those particular 10 uh, wards at the bottom of the list. So the effect of the bedroom tax measures, yeah, has been to ease the impact on the worst affected wards rather than to spread benefit around uh, evenly across Scotland or indeed even to favour the, uh, the most uh, affluent and most prosperous wards. It's the, it's the poorest wards that have been benefited most by that measure. That's, that's very helpful. And in terms of the, the £35 figure uh, per, uh, on, on an average basis per working age uh, adult that you've uh, identified, can you split it between the two measures? How much is... Uh, for the measures uh, for the bedroom tax and how much is in terms of council tax benefit? Um, the, the impact, I, th I, I recollect, has been about £20 is, is associated with the measures to ease the impact of the bedroom tax and about 15 I believe, uh, uh, associated with the council tax benefit uh, measures. Um, but those are very rough and ready uh, statistics. I'm sure, sure if somebody sat down you know, in, in the Scottish Government with a calculator, they could probably give you a much more precise number um, than that. But that's, all, that's very broadly what, we, what the impact uh, has been. Well, I appreciate the rough and ready uh, estimation. And one last question. It can be done, uh, again, you, you picked up on this in your uh, presentation, Professor uh, Fothergill, you uh, make the point that I'll just quote your report. You say Westminster ministers are keen to claim that the welfare reforms will increase incentives to work and will therefore lead to higher employment. As we noted, this is a bold assumption based on a questionable view of how the labour market works, especially in less prosperous areas. And you say the evidence in your report suggests that the gaps in income living standards between communities in Scotland are set to widen. And that was the point you made there. Can you just talk a little bit more? about that and why this is your conclusion? Um, um, yes, when I'm commenting that um, I, I'd be immensely surprised if the, um, the welfare reforms uh, lead to much higher labour market engagement, much lower un un unemployment, 
I'm really drawing on, not so much on the research we've done here, but more on my, my long experience as a labour market analyst and, and the researcher on regional economic development. It, it, it does seem to me um, that increasing labour supply by pushing people off benefit, let's say, and out there into the, into the labour market doesn't necessarily raise employment levels, except perhaps at certain times and in, in certain places where the labour market is, very, market is very tight and where you know, firms face a bit of a shortage of labour and they'll, they're crying out for any workers. And you know, there are times and places where that does apply. I think it applied in large parts of southern England just prior to, uh, to 2008. Uh, but whether it really applies in, in some of the, uh, the poorer areas uh, in Scotland, I'm, I'm very, very sceptical. Um, you know, I'd be hugely surprised if labour supply in itself, additional labour supply, led to additional numbers overall in employment. Uh, no, 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 I don't think that stacks in large parts of Scotland. Thank you. Okay, Annabelle and then Kevin. Hey, thank you. <coughs> Convener, good morning, Professor Fothergill, and thank you very much indeed uh, for yet another very thought-provoking um, uh, report. And just a couple of questions. Uh, really f one for clarification. Um, to what extent does the, the uh, analysis presented today take account of uh, uh, disability benefit cuts? Because obviously the PIP, the PIP uh, uh, benefit is still being rolled out or not, as the case may be, if you're actually trying to get it in a pilot area, but there we go. But it is supposed to be being rolled out. It's not uniform across the country yet. And I just wonder to what extent your analysis reflects that uh, position. Right. Th this is an attempt to, to estimate the, the impact of those eight reforms um, when they have come to full fruition. And now in the case of the shift from disability living allowance to personal independence, independence payments, we've barely started um, uh, implementing uh, that uh, reform. Um, that reform will not really come to full fruition until probably well into to 2018. So the biggest part of that DLA reform um, hasn't yet happened. Um, a very large chunk of the incapacity benefit reform hasn't happened either. Now, now, that incapacity benefit, um, those incapacity benefit reforms actually encapsulate an awful lot. I mean, we're not just looking at the reforms that have been introduced by the present coalition government in Westminster. I mean, some of the things happening to incapacity benefit at the moment and in, in the last couple of years were actually, you know, first planned by Labour pre-2010 pre and, and only recently have been coming to fruition. But there's an element of the, the incapacity benefit reforms um, that uh, really has still to bite in a major way, and that's the very last part of the package, uh, which is the, uh, the limitation of non-means-tested entitlement for claimants in the work-related activity group, limiting their non-means-tested entitlement to, to one year. Uh, and because that, that bites at the back of the pipeline, most of the people who, who are now moving across onto ESA uh, will find that that hasn't yet bitten. Uh, and given that, in terms of the overall welfare reform package, that's probably one of the very largest elements um, of all, there's still an awful lot stored up um, that's going to come through in, in, the, in the next um, um, couple of years or so. You know, add that together with the, the DLA reforms, and these are often impacting on the same people. Uh, those people still face uh, an enormous hit uh, in, in, in the next couple of years. And in the worst affected wards of Scotland as well, by the way, it, it's the incapacity disability living allowance reforms that are the really big ones in the jigsaw. Uh, so when I'm saying that a place like Calton in Glasgow is hit hardest, I would suspect that a good 40% of that hit has not yet happened. Uh, that's very interesting. So I was going to go on to ask, uh, in terms of people with a disability, it seems, sadly, that uh, the, the net result is that if you suffer from a disability and you live in one of the most deprived wards in Scotland, you are subject, in effect, to a double whammy. Um, so it's not, not good news at all, uh, particularly as you rightly say that these benefit cuts are being rolled out and we don't even yet see the full impact of what is coming down the line. It's, it's not that somebody on disability benefits is hit any harder in some wards than in, than in others. 
It's more just that in some parts of Scotland, in some wards, the, the numbers, the, the percentage of the working age population out of the labour market on disability benefits is so much higher than in other parts of Scotland. I mean, typically in, in the Glasgow area, you have much higher claimant rates of, of uh, ESA, of IB, of DLA, than you do, for example, in, in the more prosperous economies um, up in Aberdeenshire. Uh, and, and so if you're reforming, you know, disability living allowance, if you're reforming incapacity benefit stroke ESA, it's going to impact on the places and on the wards where there are very large numbers of claimants, and that's particularly some of those Glasgow wards. Yes, I absolutely accept that. I think the point I was rather trying to make was that um, uh, in terms of other uh, problems that will therefore be prevalent in your community, if you are disabled in a very deprived ward, you have, there will be other issues that uh, impact on your daily life uh, as a result. One other question I had in terms of what we hear from um, uh, Westminster, uh, the Westminster government and indeed Westminster parties that there will be further benefit cuts uh, planned. Does this take any account of that at the moment or is that too, uh, you know, too no. distant no, uh, at this point? Uh, this is an exercise in, in looking at what is in the pipeline now um, and what is going to hit. Um, you know, it doesn't include... Um, things that are being talked about that might be introduced, you know, beyond May uh, 2015. That's a, a further exercise, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we, we don't need to get you back for that one from my perspective. But uh, thank you, convener. Thank you very much, Professor. Kevin and then Linda. Uh, thank you, convener. And can I thank Mr. F uh, Professor Fothergill for um, the report that uh, it makes. Uh, very grim reading indeed in some regards. Um, and I'm, I'm going to ask a few questions, and I, 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 I'm not meaning to be critical in terms of the report itself, um, but what we have is an exercise based on council wards. Uh, you mentioned, I think, at the, at the beginning that, um, uh, that you could go down to data zone level. Is that correct? Um, a lot of the statistics that are fed into this um, is actually statistics at, at, at the level of data zones. Now, data zones in Scotland you know, have um, you know, a population of between 500 and, and 1,000. Um, I think our judgment is that though we had to throw that information into, into the pot, if we were to generate statistics right down at that very, very fine grain, they wouldn't be terribly reliable. You know, because, you know, if you're on about some benefits of, you know, where there might only be 20 or 30 people in a particular data zone claiming that particular benefit, you know, you can't be sure that those 20 or 30 people are, are hit, um, you know, in, a, in an average way, if, if, if you like. Um, I think the statistics are reliable up at the, the level of um, electoral wards, where we're typically looking at a population of... I think about 15,000, but at a finer grain, there would be a, a, a lot of ropiness in, in, in the numbers. There's an additional problem out there, which if you start listing um, uh, data zones, I mean, they don't mean very much to a lot of people, whereas across wards, um, our, our unit, which particularly most local politicians can, uh, can relate to very clearly. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, I think in terms of some of the wards that exist, um, at this moment in Scotland, they don't actually reflect communities, and data zones often um, reflect communities. One of the things, uh, convener, which uh, which bothers me um, is the fact that uh, in a number of wards, and if we look at Aberdeen in particular, <coughs> and I realise that Aberdeen um, is is not uh, the hardest hit. There are areas within Aberdeen which will be uh, immensely hard hit. You have Northfield in dark blue there, which is in the Aberdeen Donside constituency, which is uh, the average hit is £560. Um, and Northfield consists of a number of communities which are um, high in the, the scale of multiple deprivation or at risk. Uh, but if you take, for example, Hilton Stock at Hill, uh, which bounds Aberdeen Donside and Aberdeen Central, um, and Tilly Drone Seaton, Old Aberdeen, which is entirely in um, Aberdeen Central, where the hit for Hilton Stock at Hill is £440 on average, £350 in Tilly Drone Seaton, Old Aberdeen. Um, these are uh, wards where there are um, socially excluded areas, but there are also areas uh, of quite a lot of wealth. Um, and I think that, you know, that these 
kind of skew um, impact on, on communities. I, I know I'm maybe being um, overly uh, technical and trying to, to, to drill down as far as we possibly can. But, uh, you know, uh, it, it is quite clearly the, cl the case that communities um, within Aberdeen, which is one of the least affected places, are still being immensely hit. And within those uh, communities, individuals and fami families are taking a huge hit because of these reforms. Yeah, it, it's always a question of judgment as to how far down you, you try to drill these statistics. I mean, if, if the average ward in Scotland is 15,000 people, I mean, to my mind, that's getting fairly close to, uh, to, to defining a, a community. But um, as I say, I, I'm not entirely convinced that these figures would be hugely reliable at a finer grain, and that even if we then produce them at a finer grain, uh, we'd be all, all open to the argument that even if we identified... Um, you know, uh, data zones where um, you know, there was not much of a hit from the reforms, there would still be individual households and individual people within those data zones uh, for, for whom you could say, ah, but that person's going to be hard hit, even though they live, you know, in an otherwise um, really prosperous and, and escaping lightly um, data zone. Um, to we're always vulnerable to that argument. But your, your argument is fundamentally correct that, you know, you will still find some people hit hard even in, in the white areas on, on, on the map. It's just that, you know, in the context of the ward as a whole, there are relatively few of them. Thank you. Uh, the reason why I'm, I'm trying to get this drill down, because obviously um, these effects um, of, of welfare reform uh, are going to have major impacts. You said yourself earlier on, the higher the level of deprivation, the higher the financial hit um, for people. And f for us as policymakers, I wish we had control over um, welfare here in Scotland, and hopefully we will do soon. But for us in, in the, the policy making decisions that we are taking, um, you know, I think that we have got to be aware uh, of, of the hit um, that are taking place in socially um, deprived communities. Uh, convener, uh, the point that I'm trying to get across is, although some areas seem to be not that hardly hit, there are areas within those areas uh, which are taking a big hit. Um, and there's nothing worse, I, I find, uh, than poverty amidst plenty, which we, we certainly have. And, uh, in Aberdeen. But as policymakers looking at other areas, I think we've got to take account of those data zone numbers before we implement other policies to try and regenerate communities and resolve deprivation. I think what you need to bear in mind is that even if you're down in the, the bottom left-hand corner um, uh, of uh, that particular graph, you know, the, you were in a relatively prosperous ward that's hit lightly by the, the reforms. You know, the impact of any one of the reforms on a particular individual or on a particular household is not necessarily any less than uh, the, the impact on a comparable household you know, at the other end of the, of the spectrum. Um, all that the re relationship with deprivation is, is saying, really, is that in terms of wards, um, in this instance, you know, groupings of, of 10 to 15,000 people, um, the overall impact is much higher where you have higher levels of deprivation. But somebody who's hit by, um, let's say, the, uh, the bedroom, well, they won't be hit by the bedroom tax here now, but somebody who's hit by the incapacity of benefit reforms is just as likely to be hit as hard in a non-deprived ward as in a deprived ward. I, I don't think I would ever take away from the individual scenarios that are going on, which uh, are having great effect on, on people and their families right uh, uh, across Scotland. But in terms of policy making, um, you know, I think we've got to take into account not only the ward level, but the data zone level too. Thank you, convener. And finally, Linda. Yeah, I just have uh, one question. It's a very general one. I was interested, um, Professor Fothergill, in your, your last key point in your summary, which was referred to by Jamie Hepburn, and that's the one about um, a key effect of the welfare reforms will be to widen the gaps in income between communities, that being in the absence of a big shift into employment. Hmm. Um, we started off this session with Alec Johnson um, noting, or asking it to be noted, that uh, other initiatives that were being taken were not taken into account 
in this study. And you very kindly responded to that from wider experience than, mm. than just what was used for this report. So I, I just wanted to ask you whether, in your view, the wider action that has been taken, the global picture, as Alec Johnson referred to, uh, about taxation as well as welfare reform, I wondered if you felt there was anything within that which would, in fact, narrow uh, that gap in income between communities. Um, I mean, I, as I tried to say earlier, I'm very sceptical about the whole idea that if you um, increase labour supply, you therefore automatically increase labour demand. As a general rule, um, it, um, it doesn't uh, seem to, um, to, to apply. Um, you know, as I, as I was also trying to say before, this is inherently just a, a, a look at one thing that's going on uh, in, in the world um, at the present point in time. But it's, it's a big, powerful element of the, of, of the jigsaw. Um, it's not an attempt to, to measure you know, the changing well-being of communities. It's the impact of a particular um, uh, set of policies. Um, I was very, very interested to, to hear a former civil servant uh, speak at a seminar that I attended recently when um, he was um, commenting, and he was an ex-Treasury official, and he was commenting on how the, um, the welfare reforms had been um, sort of planned and dreamt up in, in, in their present form. Um, and what it was clear to me that he was saying was that actually they are driven by um, financial savings and that if ministers and others have been going around and saying that they, these welfare reforms um, you know, will raise levels of employment and rebuild the economy, uh, that was very much a window dressing that was put on um, after the event. Um, primarily this is about saving money. Um, some people would like to believe that the, the reforms will raise the volume of employment, the level of economic activity. But um, I, I think deep down, even in the Treasury, they don't believe that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Fothergill. As I said at the start, um, a very, very valuable piece of work. Uh, I understand some of the the concerns about you know the, the fine detail, but equally you know in response to, to what Kevin Stewart said, in my own area um, you've highlighted the local authorities that uh, are in the area that I represent, within areas that are very badly hit, there are pockets of wealth um, which aren't reflected in, in the data. So it, it swings and roundabouts, I suppose, in, in, in terms of that. So overall, I think the, the information that you provided has been hugely beneficial uh, to the committee. It gives us a lot of uh, work to, to get on with, uh, more analysis and, and more discussion, but based on firm statistics now rather than anecdotal evidence or supposition. And that's always helpful when it comes uh, to, you know, to assessing policy and, and its impact. And I think um, you, know, you, you said that the, the welfare reforms were window dressing in terms of, of what their ambition is, I think that's been very... I, I, I'm quoting a civil servant yes, there. I, I think <laughs> Who better remain nameless. I think, I think he should. I think he's, uh, he, he's, he's, he's also... And he was a former a very, civil servant as well. <laughs> I, I think he's also been very, very kind. Um, but that, that's not uh, a matter for you to, to judge. That's a matter for us to judge. And uh, we can now do it based on very firm evidence. And thank you very much for providing it. And thank you very much again for coming before us this morning to, to give us more uh, assessment of your analysis, which has, I think, been very beneficial to us all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll suspend for five minutes to allow change of witnesses.
open the meeting back up again by going to the, our third item of business today, which is an evidence session from members of the expert group on welfare and constitutional reform on their second report, Rethinking Welfare, Fair, Personal and Simple. I'd like to welcome Martin Evans, the chair of the expert working group, uh, Lynn Williams, a member of the expert working group, and David Watt, who is also a member of the expert working group. I'd also like to welcome Susan Anton, who is an economist and secretariat to the expert working group. Welcome to you all. I'd like to invite Martin Evans to make introductory remarks before we open it up to questions. Over to you, Martin. Thank you, convener. Uh, the group was asked to look at the medium and long-term options for reform of the social security system in an independent Scotland. And our report, Rethinking Welfare, outlines a Scottish benefit system for those of working age. We also provide a route map of how to get there. I am indebted to my fellow group members for their expertise and insight and for the healthy challenge that each brought to our discussions. I know that I and they greatly valued the independence of the group and the space this provided for our deliberations. And I would like to emphasize our independence as this was central, a central condition of all of us joining the group. I valued having members from the academic, business and the third sector. And we're also unfortunate to have experts from around the UK and indeed from Europe. In order to support our work, we developed a detailed and targeted process to help build our knowledge and establish a firm evidence-based foundation for our recommendations. We received direct written evidence, convened stakeholder session, commissioned research, held meetings with benefit recipients, wider civil society, academics amongst others. We have drawn extensively on the available demographic uh, and statistical information for Scotland and its performance in relation to other parts of the UK and other nations in Europe. My very sincere thanks to all of those from within the benefit system who shared their stories. Many of these were deeply personal, and while some were difficult to hear and others uplifting, all were shared with us openly and honestly, and our report is greatly strengthened by this direct experience. We did not formally meet with the civil servants delivering the current welfare system. It was a surprise to me that there were over 10,000 civil servants delivering the system in Scotland, not just delivering to Scotland, but also to significant parts of the United Kingdom as well. They are a great asset now and critical in the future should Scotland vote for independence. And nothing in our report should be seen as a criticism of those delivering the policies which we find so unfit for purpose. We learned in evidence from New Zealand how they there value these delivery civil servants much more highly than we do here. Here it is policy civil servants who have the status and influence. The best and most effective change process comes from combining experience both around delivery and policy, and that is an important lesson for the future. Our conclusion was that Scotland has a benefit system developed over time that is now too complex and too remote. It can be impersonal and can work against the needs of citizens for support. It is increasingly losing the trust of those involved. An independent Scotland would quickly need to start to rebuild trust and confidence in a system that many feel is broken. This key issue of trust is very wide. It includes the trust of those that receive benefit payments in a system that supports them, and importantly, the trust of society as a whole in the fairness and effectiveness of, their syst of the system. A lack of trust erodes society's continued support for those in receipt of Social Security, as well as undermining the self-esteem and confidence of those in receipt of support of the benefit system. We divided our work into strategic analysis, strategic choice, and, and an implementation framework. Our strategic analysis was that Scotland has a very strong economic foundation. Across the range of indicators, Scotland is wealthy and productive. Performance relative to the whole of the UK as a whole and its nations and regions is strong. And Scotland's assets go further than just its people. There's a clear sense of value of public services, communities and voluntary efforts in Scotland. Just to give one side of the positive side of our analysis, Scotland has a skilled population. In recent years, there's been a steady decrease in the percentage of working age adults with low or no educational qualification. Scotland compares well internationally in terms of educational level achievements and performs best of all the nations in the United Kingdom with the fewest people with low skills and the highest number with high skills. A warning, though, and as the number of working-age people in Scotland with low skills has fallen significantly, the risk associated with poor, poor qualification has grown significantly. 
On the negative side, we found current employment rates, for example, amongst older workers to be significantly lower than the best in Europe. Men aged 55 to 65 in Scotland have very low employment rates compared to the best in OECD countries. And equivalent figures for older women are worse. So while Scotland is somewhat more equal than the UK as a whole, it's still more equal than many other OECD countries. And it's increasingly recognised that inequality is not just a moral issue. Inequality is a, is a severe drag on economic performance. We firmly believe in the group that paid employment is the best route out of poverty for anyone who can realistically be expected to work. The reality is that far too many people today, a job, is no longer, a job no longer guarantees this. Changes resulting from the hollowing out of the labour market, the prevalence of low-paid jobs and the increasing casualisation of employment mitigate against the availability of secure, sufficiently remunerated work for many people. You know very well that approximately 40% of people live in households with at least one member in work, and poverty is not evenly spread across the, uh, the, the population. Households with disabled people or people from ethnic minority, minorities are more likely to live in poverty. Over half children in poverty are living in households where at least one person is working. Now, we discussed the issue of work at great length. To raise benefits to address poverty was not a credible pro proposition for us. For example, to ensure a couple with two children had an income, leaving aside their housing costs and their childcare costs, to meet the Joseph Rowntree Foundation minimum income standard would meet a £10,000 a year rise for that couple. Of all the hundreds of sentences and thousands of sentences I read for our report, the best, in my view, came from a Spartacus network report, Beyond Barriers. Spartacus is a network of sick and disabled activists developing evidence-based policy. They wrote, work for those who can, security for those who can't, support for all. But it has to be good work. Good work depends on demand from employers for skills and the ability of employers to pay good wages. It needs a business environment that encourages investment and productivity. We found that unpaid care contributes significantly to the economy provided by providing support that would otherwise be, be provided by the state. However, caring for children or someone with a long-term illness or disability has a significant impact on the ability of households to work and the extent to which they need help from the welfare system. Supporting individuals as they move from one phase of their lives to another, from unemployment to employment, is a key to a modern social security system for Scotland. Such a system should recognise society as changing with caring and employment responsibilities shared amongst the family and recognise the changing role of women and their contribution to the economy and society. Currently, inequalities in employment, rates of poverty and income inequalities and the cost of caring suggest that what Scotland currently has fails to adequately offer this support. Scotland is in a very positive position regarding affordability of its social security system. The choice facing a future independent Scottish Government is to decide how best to use its financial and human resources to obtain the best results for its people. We examine social security models from around the world and fuller descriptions are on our report. The best known, perhaps, is the Nordic model, which is based on the idea of universalism. The Liberal model provides safety net levels of means tested benefits for encouraging working, and there's a continental model of a contributory system which is generous to those in work or who have recently become unemployed, but there's little support for others. We concluded there is no ideal model type for Scotland to follow, or indeed import wholesale. We must find our own approach in Scotland. However, we are very keen on policy learning from other jurisdictions, but our conclusion was that wholesale policy transfer from another jurisdiction is vanishingly rare and not appropriate in this circumstance. Our strategic choice was that Scotland would have to rethink welfare. The approach in Scotland would have to be one that suits the needs of the people of Scotland, builds on explicit and agreed values, and commands sustained and widespread public support. We looked at purpose, and we, pro we proposed the purpose for an independent Scottish social security system must be to provide a safety net through which individuals cannot fall. It must also provide an assurance against life events and then maximise life chances for every individual. In other words, to provide a springboard as well as a safety net. We then looked at principles of a welfare system. These principles 
represent the tests against which any new policy or changes to existing or inherited policies should be proofed. They are grouped under three overarching headings. The system should be fair, personal and simple. It was clear to us that these three important policy objectives or principles are held in serious tension. Our conclusion was that it's a real challenge to deliver all three in equal measures. So our report has chosen to emphasise fairness and personalisation in the short term, with a focus on simplicity in the longer term. We've outlined our purpose and principles in the report. Who then are the partners to develop these further? And we identified and said there were three. Individuals, firstly, with their families and their communities. They need support from each other and from the state. Secondly, employers. Employers need the individuals that are prepared to work. They need a state to provide an economic background and investment for infrastructure, uh, which enables their businesses to grow. And lastly, the state needs employers to create good jobs, to minimise in-work benefits and maximise tax return. Those partners are the critical cogs in the system and must have to assist them a very wide range of civil society organisations to provide the oil to help them work most effectively together. These civil society organisations include trade unions, business associations, user groups, campaign groups, think tanks and academics. In terms of an implementation framework, we recommended that a national convention on social security is established at the beginning of 2015, made up of these partners along with their civil society support to establish a social security partnership for Scotland and new social contract. And we drafted an outline contract in our report. An independent Scotland will inherit a patchwork of policies and approaches that have been built up over the uh, last uh, 50 to 70 years. We are confident it is possible to establish something which better suits the needs of a small, independent country. We heard evidence of a widespread will to build a new system which is both fit for purpose and progressive. This endeavour, we are in no doubt, will take an enormous shared effort. It is clear there is no easy solution. It will require our political representatives, people from across civil society, the business community and others, to enter into a willing partnership with future Scottish governments to create a social security system we can trust and share in. And we set out a route map for that. We made a series of over 40 recommendations, which I won't go through these one by one. But amongst other things, we recommended the re-establishment of the link between benefit levels and the cost of living, the introduction of a new social security allowance for Scotland, the abolition of the bedroom tax sanctions and the work capability assessment, the increase of the carers allowance to the same level as the job seekers allowance, and raising the national minimum wage to equal the living wage. In the medium term, we must plan how to support those in our society who most need the support rather than react in an ad hoc manner. We were very impressed with the evidence that a serious and sustained focus on pensioner benefits over the last two decades has significantly addressed pensioner poverty. Indeed, I was at an event in Kakodi a couple of weeks ago when Gordon Brown was in conversation with Sir, Don, Sir Tom Devine. Tom asked Gordon Brown what he was most proud of in his political career. Without hesitation, the reply was the reduction of pension of poverty from over 30% to less than 10%. We recommend a similar sustained focus on benefits for people who are sick or disabled and who may be unlikely to find a route to well-being through work. Our last recommendations are for the longer term, this search for simplicity. We set out two of the most coherent future propositions, a contributory-based system and a universal income-based system. We could at the moment support neither on the basis of cost. The evidence to us that the costs of introducing these systems are high, with basic rates of income tax creeping towards 50%. We consider the restoration of trust to be a prerequisite before any such level of taxation would even have a remote possibility of serious consideration by a credible political party. Finally, our recommendations are not just for an independent Scotland. I would quote from the 5th of June Herald editorial. Whether independent or not, Scotland needs a welfare system that treats benefit claimants and those struggling to make ends meet with dignity. And this report has some useful ideas for how that might be better achieved. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Evans. That's a, a very good overview of the report. And uh, I'm quite uh, sure you put a huge amount of effort in um, to, to achieve this. 
Um, but can I start by asking a, a couple of questions around, you know, the, not so much the remit, but the basis <coughs> on which you were working. Did you impose on yourself or did you have imposed on you any um, constraints in terms of finance of the, the overall package that, that we were you were looking at um, the, the public spend, if you like. Would, was a figure given to you? Were you given any uh, indication of the, the, the parameters around which you, you could uh, come up with suggestions? We were given none, although we did uh, work out our own estimates about the cost of Social Security, so we knew what that was going forward. We worked out our own as £18 billion. A few months after we worked out our own, the DWP came up with their own figure, with £17.9 billion. We were delighted that our figure was uh, in that ballpark. But no, we were given no cost constraint uh, uh, of that by any, any party. We were asked to look at costs, but no cost constraint. So in terms of looking at the costs, um, are, are your suggestions, the, the, the basis on which you, you've taken forward your, your ideas, Will they lead to, to higher public spending in the short term and the long term? I have you a figure around which uh, you could give us a, an indication of, of the levels to which there might be any increase? Uh, our, again, our analysis was there would be no... Uh, we, we didn't uh, say there would be... That we said there would be no uh, significant increase in public expenditure through our, our figures. Uh, actually, the DWP figures showed so there was a decline in the cost of administrating benefits over the period of time. Our own analysis was that where there would be increase in public expenditure, it would be offset by, by savings elsewhere. So we tried to set that out in Chapter 6 of our report. But we're not, uh, we weren't looking for any significant increase in public expenditure. What we were looking for, convener, was a far more effective system of using our existing resources, including... Uh, uh, our policy resources to help people back into work and support those who are on benefit and not unnecessarily penalise them for their efforts to find work. Uh, another question. You referenced um, the, the efforts of the UK government under Gordon Brown to address um, pensioner poverty. Did you look at the impact of the pension situation in a, in a future Scotland uh, in making assessments of how uh, pensioner poverty could be tackled in terms of the increased uh, demogra demographic changes and the, the cost implications of those demographic changes? Uh, we accepted our remit, which was to look at uh, benefits for working age population only, and we stuck to that remit. So we didn't look at uh, pensioner uh, uh, payments at all. We looked at working age benefits. Okay. I'll I'll pass over to the committee now and go to Jamie first, followed by Alex. Thank you, uh, Kimir, and uh, thank you for uh, coming before us uh, today. <coughs> uh, Mr Evans, you mentioned in your opening remarks that the nature of Scotland being a, a wealthy uh, country with a well-educated population and, and so on. In, in your report, uh, you say that Scotland is in a positive position regarding affordability for a, a social security system. I wonder if you could uh, set out, um, yourself and your colleagues, set out what led you to uh, that uh, conclusion and um, what, what does that essentially mean in terms of uh, our ability here in Scotland to implement changes, perhaps the changes you, you've set out? Uh, the, the evidence was quite wide ranging but essentially look, looking at overall our expenditure uh, on social protection as a percentage of GDP it's lower than in the UK and lower than a significant number of other OECD uh, countries. In terms of payment, the taxes raised in Scotland pay for our system already. So we are already paying for it. It just happens to be through a UK uh, delivery mechanism. Uh, if, we were, if we were to looking at this, we would say, yes, we raise the taxes to pay for the system. Our system of expenditure is not disproportionately high. In fact, it's lower than the rest of the United Kingdom. It's low-ish in compared to other OECD countries. So it's both affordable and sustainable. The issue is no government wants to carry on spending money on benefits if it could avoid and get people off benefits and into the tax regime. So again, that would be an objective. So uh, our analysis was, uh, as I said, uh, it's entirely affordable. The question isn't it, to us wasn't, is it affordable? We settled that question. Was It was what political choices would an independent Scotland make about how it wanted to uh, support the benefit system and invest in the future. Yeah, I, I, sure. I suppose the point, I, or what I'm asking to explore is, given it's more affordable, does it make it um, more possible or, or easier? Or 
whatever you want to, to, frame it, to, to approach it on that basis in terms of, of uh, reforming the system. So more, more than, than the current system? Or? Yes, indeed. Well, you've obviously posited a number of suggested changes. I suppose the question is, given that you're saying it's more affordable, social security is more affordable here in Scotland, does that make it, does that make it more flexible in terms of uh, implementing change? Well, I think if you have policy control, which I think you, that's the issue that you're interested in, it allows you to pursue policy objectives which are consistent with, you know, with other policy objectives you wish to have in, in Scotland. So the affordability is one issue. Then what the policy control you have allows you to actually bring other aspects of the welfare system into play. And uh, we, we set out a number of issues which we think that, could, 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 that can happen. But let me ask my colleagues if they have additional issues to say on that. I think, um, yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, I think there's a number of issues there. Firstly, um, as, as Martin outlined, they're, 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 the, what we spend in social protection in Scotland is less com in comparison. Um, what you do with that money and in the event of a yes vote with addi any additional resources is, is obviously a choice that would be made post-yes vote. We've obviously looked at the, the role of a convention and helped to set policy around that. What, what struck me particularly... Um, and all the work we did, both in, in stage one and stage two, but also just in terms of the evidence, and I, I certainly have always attended different sessions where, the, in the current system, there are a number of issues about how the system operates, um, in terms of level of bureaucracy. We talked about, for example, the committee. You looked at the, the role of sanctions and the impact of sanctions recently, um, and in terms of how, how does administration op operate already and the costs around that. Then also you have the opportunity to look, to look at, for example, how devolved and reserve services might fit together more effectively. Um, from perspective of carers and people with disabilities, the number of assessments you have to go through. So for me, there's, there's, there's a scope within all of this to look at well, how do these things operate and operate more efficiently and, and potentially what, what could you gain from that? Yeah, um May I convene to just add and, and answer to your question? I think the key thing for me, obviously, is was, first of all, being in business, we're very interested in the costs. But secondly, I think the key point is actually the whole report, as you, as you read it, is, is, from my perspective, really importantly focused on relationship to work. And it's about work. It's about positive employment for people and positively working to get people into employment. And that, in turn, is beneficial to society and it makes the whole system, well, hopefully, ultimately, less expensive, more affordable and still effective. And that's an absolutely key principle. I think it does come through the report as well. I think and just that ties in very well to actually meeting the costs we're talking about. And to answer your questions, paragraph 6.3 does say short-term changes to the current system can be readily incorporated uh, within the expenditure framework which we set out. Thank you. Yeah, I, I noted uh, Lynn Williams mentioning our report. And actually, I couldn't help but notice your conclusions in terms of the science system were quite yeah. similar uh, to uh, our own. Uh, and you also mentioned there, uh, Lynn, the a national convention which you suggest to be established in 2015 and one of the things it would uh, consider would be your draft social security partnership and just wonder if uh, the panel could tell us in how, how you think your uh, social security partnership would be an improvement on the, the current system let's start now yep. um i think i think um it goes back to the point mark made about trust and i think um from perspective of those who are part of the system and generally, is that, that there's been a real loss of trust in how the system operates for a whole range of reasons. So part of looking at the partnership was, well, what do we need to do to rebuild social security and a commitment to that in, in Scotland? Um, and, and by bringing together people who both are part of the system, who can shape the system, um, is to, to rebuild that kind of sense of contract and social, social cohesion. Um, so it was to start from the element of all together and collectively who contributes to shaping the policy in Scotland and a social security system, and then how do we develop that from there. And the report f from that perspective is, is, is essentially a route map to that. Here's a draft partnership agreement or partnership approach. Um, here's the element of trust and the kind of language and discourse we wanted to use was to change the, the tone of debate about welfare and social security, and we use the term social security rather than welfare, uh, is to change the whole debate around why we need to invest in this kind of approach. Um, so for, for, for me, the partnership is very much about rebuilding that element of trust and that people who, can, who have a, a say or a stake in the system have a, 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 real, a real role in shaping that, that system. I think one of the things we were struck by, and I'll ask David to have a word here, is when we went around speaking to pretty small business owners, 
And then we also spoke to a labour market economist. The critical role that small business plays in their communities in keeping people in employment when times are tough, both for those businesses and for the individuals in employment. The longer you're kept in employment, the more likely you are, even though you're in and out of uh, sickness benefit or something like that, to come back in. The longer, the quicker you let go, the longer you're out, the more likely you are to, rel to, lingu to relinquish on, uh, language on benefits. The, one of the keys of this kind of social, new idea of a social contract is to say we're all in this together. This is part of the building block we're saying must, you must put into a trusted social security system and not just say the benefits will sort it out. Benefits are critical, but all our, all our Murray polling and all the focus groups we had were saying benefits, cash is a start point. There's a whole range of other issues, dignity, trust, reliance, which are critical to building, rebuilding this trust we talk about. And I come back this very, very positive message we had back from small business. If they could be encouraged to keep people back in, in, in work, it, it would help the social security system. If they're open to that and can be supported with that, that helps us all. Uh, and I, would, I want to emphasize that because it was so important that, that they, were, they were considered partners in this endeavor. And that's why we put them in there with individuals, the state and business. And we were very careful to say around them becomes all these civil society organisations. It's not to forget the role of trade unions, campaigning groups. They help that partner, oil that partnership. David, you were involved in some of those meetings with yeah, me. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's a key point. I think there's a... Uh, perhaps sometimes in these discussions there's not been enough business engagement, if I'm honest, both at a, a national and a local level as well. Uh, and I spend my life defending businesses because they genuinely aren't setting out to, to put people in, into unemployment. And that's quite the opposite. They're actually looking in large part across Scotland for employees and, and well-trained employees. And I think um, also a key part of our suggestions is the real close link to skills development. And I think that's really important. It's not just about money, as Martin said, absolutely not. It's about skills development. It's about a close liaison there. So we are training people for the workforce uh, better, more competently, and they're more likely to gain employment. And importantly, as, as Martin also just said, stay in employment, because there are quite a number of people who tend to wander in and out, and it very much relates to skill level, in all honesty. Yes, it does, as the professor said earlier on, relate to demand, and that is patchy in some parts of Scotland. But at the end of the day, if you are more skilled, you're more likely to be employed. Oh, wait, one, one final point. We had this concept of distance from the labour market, which wasn't physically how far you were from a job, but how far you had to travel before you were able to take up a job. And what we recognised was we disproportionately invest on those people who are quite close to the labour market, people who have gone out of job quite quickly. We are suggesting a reinvestment on those who are quite a long way from being able to get back into a job. And that's our social investment uh, part. We were very struck by the evidence from the Nordic models about how you invested for the future, how you brought people who are a long way from the labour market. You didn't sanction them, you supported them in finding the route through the steps they needed to get closer to being employable and uh, finding those jobs. Now, there is the other side about job creation too, which you'll previous evidence was, was talking something about, but I also was talking about the systems whereby you brought people closer to the labour market, and we were saying, re relocate your investment for those who are furthest away, because those who are quite close, they'll come back in with much less help from the state. So if you're not careful, you'll pay for the low-hanging fruit, those who are close to the labour market, and you'll, un you'll disinvest on those you really need to get back into uh, work as far as possible. You uh, talk about the introduction of a, a new social security allowance combining uh, benefits together. You also talk about the bedroom tax being abolished, which, of course, there's widespread support for in this part. The, the Scottish Government of course, committed to that. But you say, crucially, you say, uh, as part of this uh, social security allowance, a housing benefit wouldn't be <coughs> included. Can you say out why you've come to that conclusion? Yes, I mean, I think we, see that we saw housing benefit as much more of a local benefit, much more able to be uh, operated through local authorities, much more sensitive to that, looking at their own housing market. Local authorities have to develop their own local housing strategies. We, we thought that was important too. We also make these comments about the private rented sector costing in Scotland half a billion pounds a year in rents, and we were, wanted to make quite sure that there was some sort of pub, uh, quid pro quo for that investment that uh, though whilst the, uh, that money's been paid out to private landlords, they weren't receiving a will, windfall benefit from rising uh, property prices in their rents, and also the issues of security of tenure. Now, we held back a little bit from the stronger suggestions about security of tenure because of the work from, of Douglas Robertson from uh, Stirling University, who has evidenced that 
A call to increase security of tenure is misunderstood by private rented sector tenants who feel they have to stay for that period of time. So we wanted more work done to, on, on, on that issue. But uh, that, that's the reason we wanted. Uh, housing is a very local matter. We think uh, uh, the more local it's, uh, it's looked at and delivered, the better. I don't know, were you also informed by the experience, obviously universal credit's not in place yet, but there's been concerns about the idea that um, uh, housing benefit being wrapped up in that and making it much more difficult, and also the issues of direct payments and so on, and, and people uh, potentially being uh, building up arrears and the rest of it. Did that, that feature as part of the, the yes, rationale as well? Yes, I, mean, I think all, all of those things are in part that. I mean, this, this idea of, of, of fairness and personalisation, we wanted to get back to this idea that trying to let, help people choose what's best for them to receive their benefit and have that benefit paid. Uh, I've uh, been around long enough to know, to remember that stage at which um, housing benefit was um, taken from individual tenants and given to, to landlords, and now the proposal is it comes back. It, it, to, to us, personalisation, let people try to choose within a reasonable uh, series of choices how they can receive their benefit to best suit them. Uh, and also we listened very closely to the SFHA and others about how, how that, those payments were made. Um, clearly we don't have evidence about the future of, uh, of universal credit, but we had a lot of concern about these is one size fit all, fits all. The, the, the period over which you receive your benefit monthly, the mechanism by which you apply for it through the computers, all these things we're saying, no, no, you need to be stepped back a bit to make it both personal and fair. You need more flexibility in the system. Uh, and I think that is possible. Speaking informally to those who deliver the system, they think it's possible too. I, I wouldn't underestimate the complexity that that g gives, and therefore we park you know, slightly to one side the simplicity objective, which we hold very dear, but we say you can't have both simplicity and personalisation at this stage. Yeah, and this uh, issue of personalisation is also reflected in your, uh, the uh, issue of assessment in relation to the... Uh, the Social Security Allowance, you, you talk about it, uh, the LI identification agreement of an individual's needs and goals should be the starting point for assessment. You also recommend that work capability assessment is scra scrapped um, and say uh, a series of new features uh, should take its place. Can you, you talk a little bit more about that, what, why you're, you've come to that conclusion? You can yeah, talk to sure. Um, this was something that was pretty close to my heart and certainly based on some of the evidence, or a lot of the evidence we received about the, the impact of the WCA and I know that as a committee you've looked at that. Um, the, the fact that it is purely... It doesn't look at a whole person. It doesn't look at the whole person, their abilities, the context in which they live. And it kind of goes back to my, career, my own career as a careers advisor about your starting point is that for someone to achieve their goals, you have to better understand what those goals are, what their abilities are, what limits them from achieving those goals. So although we didn't stress what the, the system might look like, here are the principles around that. So what is a person wants to achieve? You know, it's not about square peg and round hole. You know, the part of these people cycle in and out of unemployment is that you know, they're not given a chance to really develop their skills and abilities or here is the job you will take. It's a work-first approach. Uh, and certainly evidence we heard from academics, particularly in elsewhere, was that this, isn't, this doesn't work. Um, we, we know a work-first approach doesn't always work. So it's about actually in the longer term, how do we get people to where they want to be? Um, and, and so... The, the process is around, you know, for people with disabilities, is that what are the, the, the range of barriers that prevent them from working? It's not just about work itself, or it's about physical barriers, social barriers, and so on as well, but also, for example, the, the view of someone maybe who has care and responsibilities, you know, how do they balance that with, with, with paid work as well? So the element of looking at, of looking at assessment and, and support is that um, it starts on the basis of what, 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 the, what goals a person wants to achieve within the context of how the labour market operates. I think our policy learning from the Nordic model uh, was, is quite challenging to some of the uh, pressure groups uh, in Scotland. They have to address the issue of, if you to build trust in a system, what are the rules you have to apply to receive benefit, the activation rules, the conditionality rules? And this is part of that discussion to go through the National Convention to say what, what those should be. We were very struck by the evidence from the Nordic countries, how trust in it, very high levels of trust in that system relied on the people taking a very clear role, each of the parties taking a very clear role. And part of that is fair assessment, of course, critical, uh, absolutely critical to that, and personalisation, having it suited the person. Part of that is also that it's not just the job can't be the first option. There are people, as I said, a long way from the labour market. They need support into the voluntary sector, volunteering, other forms of activity too, but without the harsh current system, 
of sanction, and it seems like quite a binary approach to us. So we, we were very struck by, by this conversation that is a progressive conversation. If you're to build trust in the system, what are the rules that you would uh, seek uh, each of those parties to apply to themselves and to others? Coming back to this issue of trust, people sometimes, again, reframe that as trust of people in receipt of benefit. That is very, very important, as we say. But there's also the equally important trust of wider society in the benefit system. Only when those two are better aligned can you have the best possible outcome. Thank you. Okay, Alex, followed by Ken. I talk to people almost every day uh, who believe they have been told that Scottish independence will lead to an instantaneous multi-billion pound step change in the redistribution of wealth through taxation and benefits. That's not what you're talking about, is it? Our, I mean, our starting point was the people of Scotland had voted for independence, so we didn't make a comment about mm -hmm. that. Our proposal is within the envelope, not that we were set, but that we choose to operate, it is possible to rethink a more progressive welfare system. And it is within the envelope that we set ourselves, which is with the £18 billion pound current system, which we say is affordable because the taxes that are raised pay in Scotland pay for that system. So I think that's answer your question, I hope. So what we're talking about is, in effect, uh, a proposal, a different proposal, certainly, but a, propos a proposal for radical welfare reform. Would that be a fair description of it? Well, I think what our description would be it's a rethinking of welfare because we keep on coming back to this idea. The money is important, but all those things that surround it, the respect, the dignity, the trust, those are also important. And they are not peripheral to the issue. They are actually central to how you deal with welfare and you actually drive well-being through a welfare policy which recognises those things. And our evidence to us was people do not, at the moment, trust the system, rightly or wrongly. Those in receipt of benefit and wider society have a degree of distrust in it. So our line was rethink welfare. That was uh, the, the strap line that, that we used uh, within the three principles we set, fair, uh, personal and simple. You wouldn't be the first people to propose uh, a set of principles to radically reform the welfare system. Uh, we're going through uh, one of these sets of proposals at the moment, and it has not been easy. Uh, Timescales in particular have been difficult. How do you see your proposals uh, being affected by timescales? What timescale do you envisage for it? When will it begin to deliver, and how long will it take to complete the process? Uh, a line is this, you have to start in uh, almost immediately, and the Scottish Government did make a response to our report, and then you have to set up, in our view, 2015, this uh, partnership arrangement to discuss all we're talking about. Uh, our initial report talked about trans a transition. The Scottish Government said the two-year transition from independence to a new system. We keep on coming back to, to this. It's an enormous effort. Let's not underestimate that. It's a shared effort which can only be successful. All the parties we're talking about are in there. We didn't set out a time scale uh, for this. We just said within five years for the short term. So we said within five years, all that we suggested for the short term should be able to be uh, agreed. How do you envisage the transition between the existing system, perhaps not as it is today, but as it may be when the transition uh, takes place and the system you envisage. How long will that take? Is it something which won't begin until 2018? Uh, is it something that will take five years or more uh, to complete the transition through? Uh, our first, uh, Lynn will come in, but our first report set out a transition timetable which the Scottish Government uh, cut to two years. We said it slightly longer. Th th their commitment is within two years of independence there will be a, a new system as I uh, re recall their position, but our, our own position is that's for, the, that's for the parties to decide the transition. Mm. Uh, the important thing for us was protect the claimant interest through that period. That's what we kept on saying. Concentrate on the claimant interest and maintain the benefit levels to make sure that's effective. The Scottish Government's made a, uh, made a commitment to do it in two years. Am I... Mm -hmm. yeah, remember that right, Lynn? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, sorry, what I wanted to say was, I really pick up Martin's point, was that there are choices that will be made that are not in our gift to make. Um, the, the rough timelines we set out, I think, in the report were around, as Martin says, five years initially for, for the short-term goals, and then roughly five to ten years for others. Um, I think, looking back at the last session we gave, 
last year we talked about almost like a twin track approach where um, certainly from my own perspective is that clearly from the evidence we received that some of the damage that has been done just now has to be rectified in some way. So within the first couple of years, some of the immediate changes we've discussed, for example, increase in carers' allowance is the lowest income replacement of all the benefits, um, despite the contribution of carers. Um, some of the issues around work capability assessment, how it operates. Um, so some of these things, from my, my perspective, need to be tackled immediately because the, there is a lot of damage that's been done. Um, and then, secondly, the other issue is that there's clearly an election in 2016, so that in itself will affect the whole environment around, around this, this, this discussion. And obviously, as circumstances change, you know, if, if financially if Scotland becomes stronger and things are, are a bit more um, economically strong, then maybe things can speed up. You know, we, we don't know that. There's a lot of things we, we, we can't look into the future and see. What we've done, I think, is, is provide a strong route map and a direction of travel which some people might say is radical, some people might, might not. But, I mean, what we've done is hopefully try to change the whole discourse around this. What, certainly the message I got from first sector colleagues from the very beginning of all this process was if you change the discourse, you've achieved a hell of a lot. And I think, you know, from, from our perspective, that's part of the reason for that. But, so there, there, are, there are factors out with our control that would determine the kind of timescales or issues that, that you identify, I think. The, when we, when you were before the committee the last time, uh, we sort of glossed over issues uh, like tax credits, for example, because we made the assumption that tax credits would be history and universal credit would be in place before any change started. Is that still the assumption you're making? Uh, I think it's very difficult for me to make assumptions which aren't in our report. We, what we try to do in our report is set out the short-term objectives which you said should be achieved and then the medium and the long term. It is a matter of the details about how one would do that transition are a matter for the parties. What we did discuss was that tax credits seemed to have morphed into a mechanism by which uh, uh, low-paid employment was, uh, was subsidised. So we were very concerned with that. If we were to kind of tackle in Scotland this issue about the, the, route, into, the route out of poverty is through work, you would have to address the issue of well, what is the purpose of tax credit and could they be better applied was our question. We didn't then say do this. The question you're addressing is just um, how complicated would that transition be? We're saying it's a, it is possible. It is, it, it, we, the words we use are it takes an enormous shared effort. We have the human resources to do that, we think, in these 10,000 civil service, the policy direction that the Scottish Parliament would, would, would provide and the willing partnership we think should be brought to it the financial resources we say are there to do it. You, as you well know, looking at the welfare reform you've just been talking about, it is a complex business. And our, our, our judgment is this. In, it is possible, because we look to other small countries, to have a progressive welfare system. It is possible to have it in Scotland. It's affordable. We think the will is there. That was our conclusion from the evidence we took. And we didn't just sit in a room. We went out and spoke to a whole range of parties. We spoke to, importantly, to the key people in business and the communities about this. And uh, I think we do. I think our, our take was, well, I don't know how the people of Scotland uh, will vote in September. We were asked to assume they did vote in a particular way. And if they did, the assumption was people would, would work hard to make it work from all parts of uh, Scottish civil society and political society. If we're making the, the rough assumption that as we go forward it'll be roughly on a revenue neutral basis, spending the same money in different ways, what are the costs, the likely costs of transition? Uh, specifically, does a fast transition have a greater cost than a slow transition? Is there opportunity for uh, the Scottish Government to work uh, in conjunction with the UK Government for a significant period of time and share uh, the uh, the, the costs uh, and the, the process of transition? Or are we looking at something that will simply not cost us anything regardless of what we do it, how we do it? Well, there's been a lot of debate about transition, as we all know, especially the report published yesterday. The interesting thing about this area is the shared interest of both the UK government and the Scottish government in a smooth transition, not only for the benefit recipients in Scotland, because a significant amount of benefits are delivered in Scotland for people in London and elsewhere. So the smooth transition is the interest of both governments. Um, there is no pre-negotiation taking place. That's why uh, we couldn't discuss any of the details with the DWP about this. But, of course, informal discussions would be 
If it's in the interest of both parties to do this, it's in the interest of both parties to have a sensible discussion, the smoothness of it uh, would be something for the parties to achieve. Uh, we think it is entirely possible because we keep on coming back to that. The financial constraints are, well, as we set them out, they are an envelope which can be done. The human resources are there as well. So we are, as far as we can be, confident that everybody we spoke to wasn't saying no. It was speaking to we can't say this publicly, but if that happened, yes. Because my opening remarks were always, in the event of the people of Scotland saying yes to independence, what would be your contribution to building an independent social security system? Well, the first resistance I had was a question about would they or would they not vote yes. I just had to let that ride and then say, come back to the question, that is not the issue. Let's assume they did, what would be the contribution? And I think I was very impressed. I mean, I was very impressed by a whole range of people. It may get them into trouble, but some of the DWP people I met informally, yes, they, they would apply, I say, uh, I think they would apply a, a progressive, uh, supportive view to this. I can't guarantee that, but that's the impression I got from speaking privately. Alex, uh, Ken, to be followed by Kevin. Hey, can, I just, <coughs> thank you, Barney. can I just pick up on that, uh, just on the last point? Um, just, uh, first of all, I should actually say that uh, if it wasn't... For the, it's a big premise based on independence. Putting that to one side, if I may, uh, that's a big if, um, I have to say I quite welcome a lot of the work that's going on here, and particularly your emphasis on rebuilding trust and focus on the work and so on. I think that, uh, a lot of things we could all agree on. But there are some difficult... I mean issues, as there are always with welfare, and cost gets to the heart of it. Um, did you look at transitional costs? How much would it cost um, to introduce this system? What are the additional costs? That is? Um, as far as I thought I'd try to answer that question, the, the, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, I'm there's, a, there's a new... Yeah, well, I'll try, try, try again. Uh, the short-term changes to the current system can be readily incorporated, paragraph 6.3. Uh, in terms of the transition costs of one system to another, we thought that's, that is, as has been indicated there, a matter of how the parties negotiate. And Let's how, assume willingness. Did you well, put a cost, did we you think they'll be entirely uh, within, within, within the current... I think that currently the cost of administration is half a billion pounds in Scotland. Well, it's actually 0.7 of a billion. It's quite high, reducing to 0.5 billion pounds. We think within that envelope, you could you could manage these transition costs. So there will be no, no additional transition costs? Well, there will be some, but there will be some significant savings too, we believe. So we, what, what, we can't put the figure... Well, the say, over the transitional period, there will be some savings in terms of how better people are helped into work, uh, how, how better the system is operating. Usually. So, well, I, I, I would hope so, yes. yes. Yeah. Well, over the period of transition, over the period of... Uh, I think the government is saying a two-year transition period. Just one very simple example, I might give it, and I think it's really fundamentally important, is a, a closer working relationship to the point of, I would hope, ultimately, personally, merger between uh, Job Centre Plus and Skills Development Scotland, for example, would be a massive improvement, so that it was a, a one-stop shop for the individual, and that, in fact, would be a saving. So I, mean, I think there's a real potential for that. That closer working together would, A, help the individual, and B, save in the short and long term, and indeed, initially, would not cost anything and so you can move to that system. So I think there are opportunities uh, within that framework to, to make pretty instant savings, um, even in terms of bluntly properties. And, you know, there's also, you know, it's not beyond the wit of man to actually make it work pretty effectively, pretty quickly. That's given cooperation is important, as Fred. No, no, that's right. I, I'm not saying it's not. I'm, I'm just trying to get to the essence of whether, whether there are costs or not costs, but you think there are, there are no additional costs. It just, for example, the, one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to have a different inflation rate for people in Scotland and uh, those in the rest of the country, but the systems will ought to be one system. Will the, will the system be able to cope with that? Is that not an additional cost by itself? I think that has to be part of negotiations, I think, in terms of... I mean, certainly, um, going back to our first report, you know, yeah, you have to look at how the system would manage that. It has been doable, I mean, I think, with, with particular changes in Northern Ireland we discussed at the last session. But, yeah, I think that's a valid point, is that, you know, how does that negotiation pan out? And what kind of agreement do you have in place with the DWP to take account of those, those changes? Um, I, I mean, I think the two-year transition period probably is relatively reasonable to do that in. Um, I think, though, the, 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 there's a wider issue here is that... Um, when you begin to look at, we're talking about the benefit system and we've, we've identified what the cost of those are based on uh, reasonable and, and quite robust estimates. 
But there's a wider envelope here of different resources that would have immediately come into play. Um, David has mentioned some about the role of how you look at employability. You've got the work programme. I mean, obviously, for example, Labour's Devolution Commission recommended devolution of the work programme. So there's, I think, £100 million, I think, is roughly the cost around that. Um, you know, you've got a whole other range of policies, for example, employment law, in terms of how people balance things like work and care and things. So there's a whole lot of wider range of issues here that rather than just looking at cost in that narrow sense. Um, for, for me, and um, it's, it's what you do with that total package and, and within that that obviously we can't see. You know, we can give it a steer and we have done around what you could do with some of that package. But there are wide decisions to be made that we, we can't, again, crystal ball gaze and see, but we can provide a direction of travel. Um, so I think just to keep consistently focused on cost, I think this is the opportunities um, that potentially would be there. Just to focus, please. It's just a question. What <laughs> no. will ask? That's all. <laughs> it's quite a reasonable question. I get come back to it. I want to make clear that you say there is no additional cost. Uh, we say there is no net, no, no so net additional cost. You say there is no additional cost. I didn't say I, Well, I meant to say there is no net additional cost. There, of course, there will be costs. There will be on the balance sheet. Some will go up and some will go down. Our, our point is within a £700 million system, which is what it cost to administer the system in Scotland, again, remembering that is paid for already by the people of Scotland, there will be some additional costs. There will be offset, offset savings and efficiencies, we, we believe, they are, as we said in paragraph 6.7, 6.3, the short-term changes can be readily incorporated. So it, it would be misleading for me to say no additional costs, but no net additional costs is what we calculate there to be. Am I right in thinking that uh, the system you're describing is, uh, let's say, let's be marginally more generous in terms of benefit and entitlements? Will there be an additional cost in those terms? Will, will, will the bill, the total bill, as it were, go up? Uh, well, we, yes. Well, we depend on what you compare it to. If you compare it to no net increase within the UK uh, Just system, a bit yeah. people well, then, then there will be, uh, uh, there w there will be uh, a difference between if, you, if the status quo, and that was only going up by 1%, and the benefit system in Scotland is going up by uh, CPI, the rate of inflation, in the like for like comparison, there will be that. Yes. I, mean, I, I, I do remember this, just to remind you that. Um, the UK government's committed to uh, returning to CPI to uprate benefits from 2015, 16 anyway. So in those terms, if they kept that statement, there'll be no, in like for like, there'll be no differences. Only if they didn't keep to their commitment, Scotland would be, uh, would have benefits rising uh, higher than in the rest of the United Kingdom. And if you keep that statement, the benefit system will be the same. Sorry again? And if you keep to that statement, the benefits will be the same. The benefits won't change. If the benefits won't change. Well, not in 2015, no. But the, the commitment to the 1% rise stops with the UK government 2015-16, and uh, we are suggesting that the Scottish government uprates it by CPI, and they've, uh, I think, accepted that. So the additional cost then. Um, can you just ask one of the, one of the issues again? That you, get, you, you want to restore trust again. That's very important. Uh, but one of the things you say you're going to get rid of sanctions, but you are going to replace sanctions with positive conditionality. So, just what does that mean exactly? Yeah, well, Lynn, Lynn was very strong on this, and uh, we were all we all we all struggle with this. In that, in could we have a system whereby you receive benefits and there was no condition to that receipt of benefit? You could receive benefit and work. You could receive benefit and go abroad. No, there was clearly some level at which you had to have a conditions opposed in, by society on receipt of that benefit. The question was. What were those? And if you didn't apply by it to, to those, what, what, what happened to you? And our analysis was the current system of sanctions was deplorable in terms of how it impacted on individuals. And it wasn't achieving the objective that was set for it. That didn't mean to say, and the weak thing for us to have done, would say, oh, OK, no conditionality. We spent a long time talking about mm -hmm. this. This was a critical issue. It is not easy. I would come back to challenge you know, those sometimes on the third sector to say, well, what would you then do? If it's nothing, you then undermine further the trust the general public has in the system. Our view was the social contract was critical here. If you contracted in, what was, the what, what was your um, com commitment then to, to receiving this benefit? What did you do? We took a lot of evidence on this from uh, the Nordic countries, where this is far more ingrained in the system. To, to have this view that you, you had to give something back, you had to engage. Our, I hope ours is a reasonable line that we've got here, but we put it into the 2015 
uh, group, this kind of wider society group, to work this out because these different points of view have to be argued through. Because at the end of the day, you have to come to some sort of agreement whereby everybody says, that's actually not acceptable, either for the state to do that to you or for you to do that if you're in receipt of benefits. So we were... This is a hard, hard question, and I don't want to duck it at all. And no, Lynn was involved different. in a lot of these discussions with me, but I think we came to a place where we set out a draft social contract. That's for the people of Scotland, through their representatives, to decide. Where it is at the moment, it is broken in many people's uh, experience. It is far too harsh in many people's view, and it's driving people into a place which I don't think a system should drive people yeah. to, and neither did most of the people we spoke to. Yeah, I think it's much to add, Martin. I think that was a good summary of our discussions. It is, it's an incredibly difficult topic, and I mean, I think we deflated that in the report, um, is that, that there are a range of views and, and where sanctions, should sanctions play a part in this. Martin mentioned the Nordic models, and we had the expertise of our colleague John Quist from, from Denmark, where conditionality is a strong part of some of these systems. However... The antithesis of that is there's a lot of support in place in terms of active labour market policies to ensure people are supported back into work. So the issue of meeting those, the criteria, for it, there, there isn't really an issue in the sense that you are supported back into work and as quickly as possible. And in many cases, better work or the right kind of work. Um, I mean, personally, I have, I have my own views around the sanction regime, and, and I think the evidence now in terms of how that is operating is that it's, it's moving people further away from the labour market. If the first thing in your mind is how do you feed your family? The last thing in your mind is how do I get to the job centre? Do you know so I think there's issues around how the system works. I think the, the point Martin made about rebuilding trust is with the convention, there's scope for a range of views to come into play. Probably the reflected in the views and discussion of our group is that we, what role does conditionality play? It must be a positive model of conditionality which looks at support and people to get back into work at the right time that suits them. It also then more widely looks at the, the value we place on things that are other parts of contributions which are not paid work so the value of unpaid care and contribution in terms of, and also the, the value of volunteering so for example now in the current system very often volunteering actually makes your life a heck of a more difficult whereas actually for many people that is a, a, a real route back into work and then the other side of that is looking at how you use support people back into work so we've suggested um, looking at models like Community Job Scotland, where it's not a work-first approach, it's about getting people back into paid work as well. So I think to look at sanctions narrowly, um, you're right to raise the concerns, and there is a wider debate to be had here. But for me, it's much wider than that, just it's that whole area of what does the support system look like and what part does conditionality play, play in that? I think for, for me, some of the most powerful evidence we had was some of the powerful <laughs> evidence you've had before you, the, um, the experience of people on okay. benefits, particularly those who, in technical terms, we call distance from the labour market. I had a lot of meetings with, especially with church groups and people uh, here. There's a strong desire to work. Uh, someone said to me uh, in the, when we were talking, when they were saying, we're all a little bit broken in this room, talking about themselves. They were saying, we need more support to get to where we are in a place where we can take advantage of some of these, these issues. The question is to do it in a personal way, that's why it's personalisation, in a way that's fair, both the claimant, recipient, and fair to the wider society. Now, I don't doubt that this is a vast undertaking to reimagine, rethink a welfare system for an independent Scotland. The starting point in your question was, well, we might disagree with that starting point. We, we just took our remit, I quite assure you, that we just took that as the remit. The people of Scotland had voted for this. What would be the next step? And I, I think all, all our experience was those people deserve a great deal more of our empathy and support. But in order to get that empathy and support, there must be the social contract, which was quite explicit. And the Nordic model was quite tough on that, frankly. It had been embedded in their system that if you receive benefits, you had this expectation. And if you paid a high level of taxation for benefits and there was trust in the system, it was a virtuous circle and therefore people were able to be dealt with better under that system. That was a policy learning. We, believe me, if I could have just transferred the Nordic model to Scotland and suggested that, it would save me months and months of work. Not possible. <laughs> Absolutely not possible. And anybody who tells you it is possible, okay, hasn't looked at the detail of a culture, a geography, a society, entirely different from our own. We have to find a Scottish solution, and that does take an enormous amount of effort, I think. I think two things, I suppose, from a player's point of view. I think the, 
the, the fairness of the system and, and, and the robustness of the system is something that employers really look for. And I think all in, in society in general looks for. It, it doesn't look sort of something for nothing, if you like. I think that's important. The conditionality is a key part of that, it really is. But I think, again, a point I made earlier on about the positivity of the system, and, and I think even employers would admit at the moment that the system is not seen as positive about getting people to where they need to be to get a job, to be to positioned for a post as well. I think that's really important. So these are probably two sort of industrial words, I think, that are really are relevant to employers, particularly. Is conditionality and positivity, but really doing something to help the individual we're talking about, and again being individual about them as well. So can I try and just very quickly on that? Yeah, um, I think it's two final points I want to make. Going back to the issue around cost that, that's come up frequently is that um, this is a quote from evidence we received, and I think this reflects a number of pieces of evidence was that. And it says this, the development of conditionality and sanctions and the declaration that people are fit for work and the work programme have greatly added to the complexity and administrative cost of the current system. So we have a system which, you know, people are being cycled within a system, appealing, reappealing, appealing again, or not appealing because they don't know how to appeal. Um, and the knock-on costs just from there elsewhere to other, for example, to the third sector. So there are, there are issues around that, around cost, about how that conditionality system would look like. Secondly, I think one of the things we did, which was a really strong part of our work, was the work with Ipsos Mori, which looked at groups that traditionally wouldn't take part in this debate. And what was, was interesting was the issue around you know, how the system operates and conditionality. It was a very nuanced view about that. And it was around the fact that the system focuses far too much on issues like how much money you get and how you meet those criteria. It should be more about support. So I think there's an issue about some of the attitudes we think exist in the system and also the fact that we have conditionality and sanctions themselves can actually add costs to the system. No, I, th I think... Uh, I'm starting to push time, so a quick Indeed. question if you're going to have yeah, one. No, no, last question. I just, just want to observe that, that uh, that's very similar to our own report on sanctions. That in some ways, what you're criticising is the punitive nature of sanctions. Sanctions themselves will continue to exist under your report, but uh, people, will, people will continue to lose their benefit if they break the conditions. That's the, the key thing. You've... We didn't. We, we left that, I think, open for the Convention to look at. I think Certainly, there are strong views that that shouldn't shouldn't be the case, and others will say that should be the case. I think that's for the convention well, to work in terms of partnership. Thing, yes, the language is absolutely critical. Yeah. Uh, and if you say sanctions will continue, there's a whole range of assumptions things will continue with that. Uh, and we're trying to find a new set of language to talk about this in a way which is much more positive. You know, and a cynic would say, "Well, it's just sanctions by another name." We're saying work activation critical. Conditionality, critical for, for trust. And what those mean is, if you start with the point, is there nothing that would mean that somebody had the benefit withdrawn, that if they, they defrauded the system, they'd still get the benefit, that if they worked, they'd still get the benefit? Most people would say, uh, no. So if you start with that point, at what point then do you, you require responsibility in terms of receiving the benefit? What we're saying, that is an, as Lynn is saying, that's a discussion that you have to have to base a social contract on. That's the point at which Scottish society in 2015 has to settle that as best it can in this convention. And it will not be an easy settlement, but it will have to have some hard edges, otherwise the trust will erode in the system. And you get a system which some of the progressive like, but actually people won't pay their taxes to support it. And that's the hard reality of it, in my view. So, I thought I was agreeing with you there, but there was <laughs> use of language. Uh, can I just, one final question? Okay, I don't just, think so, no. I, I just, said that would be your last question. We, need, we are not, really I, up against I, the that clock. Wasn't a question, so, just... Well, you did, so I'm going to move on to Kevin. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, the uh, situation in terms of sanctions, our report itself uh, said that there was a need for conditionality, uh, but for abolition of the sanctions regime as is, and Mr McIntosh signed up to that. And is that basically what you guys are, are saying in terms of, of your report? Yes. I mean, we read your material with great interest. Of course, we were strongly influenced by it, and it seemed to us like a, we'd have the same uh, time, uh, length of time to, to do this. But absolutely, it seems an eminently sensible approach to take. We then went that step forward to say, well, how do you then implement that? What By what route map do you do that? And we were suggesting that's not for the policy people in... Uh, the government to do entirely, they are players in that, but to bring together with other parties to try to agree that that regime broadly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you said that, uh, Mr Evans, that you can export the, the Nordic model here, but there are certain aspects of, of things that happen um, in, in other countries where um, I think, you know, the joining up of the social security system, uh, the health and the social care system, 
um, in Denmark, leading to that much more holistic approach in getting things right for disabled people and their carers. Um, that seems to work well there. Is that integration um, something that you guys would, would like to see? And do you think that um, that not only would provide um, better support um, for folks, but also uh, ha have opportunities in terms of, of cost saving too? Absolutely. We, um, and Lynn again, will, and David might want to speak about this, but. Um, the opportunity to join things up, critical, because one part doesn't actually work always in tandem with the other part, where you've got reserved and devolved matters. They can work against each other. Also, the integration, the, the, the advantages, the investment you make is recouped and gone back into the system within an integrated system, and therefore you can justify uh, social investment and preventative spend, which you can't always justify if you separate the two systems in a, a current accounting system. We also felt that the institutions you know, weren't always well joined up, preserved. And so there's all sorts of opportunities out there for these things to work better together. And we make that point quite clearly both in the summary, because we thought it was a critical point, and in more detail in the report. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the short answer to that is yes. Um, I think, uh, I mean, for, for me, from the very beginning, and certainly um, when we attended some of this, the, the, the consultation sessions, um, particularly struck, obviously, as an unpaid carer, with the session with unpaid carers, was the disconnects within both, let's be fair, to and within devolved services themselves, but also between how devolved services and reserve services clash together. So, for example, um, one of the examples that was given was carers having to give up work because there's issues around social care. Um, so there's a loss of tax revenue there. People are dependent on benefits. They don't want to be dependent on benefits. So there are opportunities to bring those services together. We, we, we suggest within, within the report that there's a chance to review those in a strategic way to look across the board at what resources we would have if there's an independent country, what are we doing just now that works relatively well and what doesn't. Um, it's just we're obviously looking at how childcare operates and we make some critique of some of the, 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 the um, commitments that we made already. Um, you know, how do these systems operate together? Where are the clashes and the tensions? One of the consistent messages we got again and again was the number of assessments people have to go through. Blue badge, community care, benefit assessment, work capability assessment, maybe for educational support needs. I mean, and for some people, their, their situation won't change. For some, for children, for example, with really complex needs, that situation won't change. Their life is the way it is. So the focus on, you know, the, the, this, this medical approach rather than looking at the person in the, the round. Um, but there's definitely a chance to look at how these things operate more effectively. So people can, who want to work, can work. Um, and there are tough questions we have to ask of ourselves about how services currently operate and are they achieving the goals they're meant to, meant to achieve. And, and certainly if you have some people that we spoke to, we know that, that there are issues there around those tensions. So for me, you know, the, the issue is if there is a yes vote, then that, that that's, that is, 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 if that's the case, then what do you do with childcare, social care? Do you look at how these things operate more effectively? How do they connect with each other? You know, how do you streamline assessment processes and so on as well? So there are great opportunities there to, to, to be had, I think. It seems that in many of these places, folks have got one point of contact and a, a one-stop shop kind mm -hmm. of scenario. Mm -hmm. Is that the kind of thing that you would yeah. like to see? I think we, we did talk about that a lot as a group, is, is that um, you know, someone was saying, if, for example, one example was given was when someone, say a child has a diagnosis of autism, for example, and they're dealing with a particular professional in the system. Now, it was, it was actually a carer who said, why don't you just press one button that says you're yeah, eligible for benefits? You know, it's, it's that kind of simplicity is that, that that person, you know, rather than having to deal with five million different professionals, and I think one example is 24 different professionals in the case of one family, is how do you then you know, make that as simple as possible. So how do you then reduce that kind of bureaucracy which in itself has got to save money in the system somewhere along the way? In terms of the holistic approach and sticking um, with that, um, I attended a, an event on Friday, I think it was, at uh, the Stuart Resource Centre run by the MS Society in, in Aberdeen. Um, and, you know, I'm always struck by the fact that um, folks want to carry on work for as long as they possibly can. Um, and, you know, we've got to give them a certain amount of independence in terms of payment to allow them to do that. Um, we've talked earlier about the small business role. Um, sometimes folks work for small businesses who find it much more difficult to cope with, with somebody being off 
uh, sporadically with, with no set warning. How can we bring all of that together to make sure that we can keep folks in work for as long as they want to be in work in these circumstances and at the same time support the business community to allow them to continue to employ um, folks? Maybe it's one for David. Uh, uh, very much. So I think it very much follows on from the point I've just made. It, it, one way it's not joined up. I mean, most of these 24 professionals that Lynn's talking about will never speak to an employer. You know, and that's the thing. There, there is no connection. I mean, now say there's only five million of us. Let's speak to each other and do things together. So almost regardless of constitutional change, we should be working together for the benefit of the individual. And I don't think that happens. I mean, most employers are not well engaged. And small employers, you're absolutely spot on, have very limited resources. They don't have an HR person. They don't have expertise. They're almost put off or scared by people who have a, a disability because they, they don't quite know how to handle it. They don't have the expertise or knowledge, which a larger business obviously would take in their stride and have be able to spend money in, in, in preparation and, and credibility and, and, and sorry, and facilities, accessibility and training. And that's tough for small employers. But we need to be, make that more available. They need to work more with the third sector specialists in certain areas, like specialist areas, as AMS, as you just mentioned, and things like that, and get more, more awareness of what's going on. So I think there's a big challenge to do that as well. But it's very much about that joined-up approach. And I think if we were talking to employers at an earlier stage and getting them, I think, to be honest, more sympathetic to the system as well, if they saw the system really working to help people into employment very positively and work with them, I don't think that happens, and indeed, even in the convention, the suggestion is that the private sector obviously be represented, which, to be honest, the private sector probably hasn't really much engaged in the system for a long time, except as a, a recipient or a sufferer, they might say themselves. Like, so the first thing is engagement. So to, to get the respect, dignity and trust within the system, which seems to be out the window at this moment in time, we need to create that joined-up approach, including not only public sector bodies, but private sector bodies to get to the place uh, where we want to be. Yeah, can I come in just to pick up? David and I discussed this quite a lot during the group was around the role of employers. Um, and I, 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 the only reason I can balance doing what I do as a carer and work is because I've got an understanding employer who's flexible around my needs. Now, they can do that just now. Um, so for me, it's, for, it means they don't have to recruit someone new, the cost of the business are losing, you know, Hopefully, what's a valued employee? Um, but I think for me, is, is, is the opportunities around things like, for example, if you have employment law, you could, you could do a lot more around some of the, the employment rights that exist already. Um, but for me, employers are critical. They're a part of the welfare system in a lot of different ways, you know, through occupational welfare and so on as well. So they, they absolutely have to be part of this partnership approach in moving forward. If we see uh, private sector employers as the problem, we're never going to get to where we want to get to. They are part of the solution. They're not the entire solution. And the reason I can be very uh, positive about that is having spent a lot of time with small employers out in the towns, particularly, you know, where they know, they know who works for them, they know their communities, they're engaged with their communities, there is a willingness to help, there's a natural civil uh, capital that they, they do care. And that is not easy to say in some, some of these discussions, but we have to say it really openly because that draws them in allows them not to see the state as just a, a cash cow to give them money, but their, their reciprocity in this. They have something serious to offer uh, to their local communities and uh, in local employment. That's why we say bring them in. As David, a very important the influence on us to bring them in. And bring them in and allow around them their civil society support organisations to help because by themselves, they're very ill-equipped to do that by the, by the nature of a small business. How can you get time off to come to something, a convention? You have to find your civil society support organisations, your business associations. Similarly, the trade unions have to come in to support. Similarly, the voluntary sector has to come in and support. But we were very clear that the private sector is as much part of the solution for a modern welfare system as the state is. It's a necessary but not sufficient area of improvement and very struck by the speaking that we did to them about the willingness to be engaged if they're asked. I think that that's your question to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, convener. Hey, thank you, convener, and good afternoon. Um, just a couple of uh, uh, points. Um, on the issue of, for example, the work capability assessment and, and the current sanctions uh, system, uh, and going back to the, the quote uh, from uh, Mr Evans at the start from the Herald editorial, uh, of 5th June to the effect that whether independent or not, Scotland needs a welfare system that treats benefit claimants 
uh, and those struggling to make ends meet with dignity uh, uh, and so on. I mean, I would make the point that, of course, uh, in order to uh, take up recommendation uh, uh, in paragraph 27 to abolish the current system of sanctions in order to take up the recommendation in paragraph 31 to scrap the, wealth, uh, the work capability assessment. Uh, it is only with independence that Scotland will be able to do that. Uh, uh, it, that is not on offer from anywhere else or uh, anybody else. That is uh, what we need to do uh, uh, and we need independence to do it. Uh, and indeed in uh, uh, chapter 3 on page 27, paragraph 3, Point four, uh, this sentence starts off, what is clear is that independence provides Scotland with the opportunity to design a social security system afresh. So I would contend that part of that would be getting rid, quite rightly, of the WCA as it currently is, the current uh, sanction system, but independence is required to do that. So I just wanted to make that point. As much as the Herald editorial was interesting, to me it, it certainly lacked a certain factual uh, link. But the point I wanted to raise substantively in terms of an, an issue we haven't uh, yet got to uh, uh, is paragraph 30 uh, and the recommendation on the, uh, to the effect that the national minimum wage should begin to rise subject to certain conditions and phased amounts to equal the living wage. A clear timetable for full adoption should be set out by the first government of an independent Scotland. And uh, the group goes on to say, we recommend the payment of employers at national insurance should, should reduce to help businesses make this transition. Uh, I think that's a very important recommendation. I know that the Scottish Government's response is that it's looking very closely at that at the moment. And I feel it, it would be uh, 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 rather odd if we didn't uh, spend a wee bit of time uh, discussing the, the thinking behind uh, that recommendation. Oh, uh, thank you. I mean, our, our thinking behind what that was, if we are to encourage people into work, it must be good work um, and it must be reasonably well rewarded. And the evidence we had was that if the uh, minimum wage had been uprated to inflation, it would currently stand at £7 an hour. And the living wage at the moment is £7.65. It didn't seem to make us to be a big gap and a big leap to be saying, let's, let's be ambitious about that. Let's move much more to the living wage. Um, so that was the reasoning behind what we were doing. Internally, uh, of course, we had a number of economists on our group and, and, and our advisors too, and they were worried, uh, quite rightly, about the behavioural consequences of that and the affordability of that. So we then put in the caveat over a period of time, by phases, as the conditions arise. Very struck by the Low Pay Commission's report, the significant number, I think it was 20 25% of current employers could currently afford uh, to pay the minimum wage, uh, to pay the living wage, uh, qu quite an extraordinary number could have currently afford it. Um, and then the move, it would be, would, would the move be, be by regulation to require it or by uh, encouragement? And uh, our, our line was, well, I actually think we owe it in terms of a growing economy to redistribute some wealth because of all the evidence we had about those who were not just people starting their careers, they were in their mid career, uh, in their mid jobs. Living, breaking a, uh, bringing up a family on a minimum wage, £6.31 an hour. So I think it was the quid pro quo of us emphasising work to say you can't just open up the labour market as it is. You had to actually have some sort of government intervention in the labour market. And I, I welcome your emphasis on that because it was an important part of our recommendation, one that we talked a lot about, about the process as well. Um, thank you. Uh, and, and in terms of the re express recommendation on the issue of, uh, of uh, uh, potential reduction in employers' uh, national insurance, um, again, it would be helpful to get a bit more of the, the background to that uh, conversation, recommendation. Certainly. The conversation that we had was this is a particularly difficult task for very micro businesses, very small businesses, to actually ask them to move from the minimum wage to the living wage, potentially. And you had to open up the possibility, what is... What would the state, what would government do to assist with that? And so we looked at uh, this issue. Maybe you could have um, £10,000 a year uh, off your national insurance bill for all businesses, not small businesses, all businesses, in order to help with that. Now, that £10,000 a year off would be completely inconsequential to, for example, Tesco, but would make all the difference potentially to a very small business. So that's what it would be. We looked at the costings of this and we felt, uh, I think the costings were an, a net gain to the Exchequer of, in an independent Scotland. So with all these issues, it's about saying, in terms of a partnership, we think, we thought the partnership should be uh, an increase of the distribution of the benefits of working 
to a wider set of society. £7.65 an hour didn't seem to us to be an unreasonable figure. Over a period of time, recognising micro and small businesses find that would find that difficult, advised by David, and therefore this uh, national insurance proposal was in there costed. Um, I don't know if, David, you want to say anything? Well, I think I summarised it very well, but I'm obviously it's a significant issue for business as well, and I certainly think oh, that's why a progressive movement in that direction. I don't think any business is setting out to, to pay people poorly. That's not what they're doing. They pay at what is an affordable wage, and ultimately, of course, the customer and, and we as the, as the public and the consumer of whatever service or product it is pay for that. Um, and I think there is this very clear link to how much the state takes out of people's wages as well, and that's where national insurance is an issue as well. So I think there's some consideration to that, and I think it will be a challenge to an incoming Scottish Government to look at that whole package and how that's actually done. But I think the recommendation we've made is a sensible uh, support, for, particularly as Martin says, small employers. We're definitely challenged by that. One of the conversations we had is you encourage people uh, to voluntarily move to the living wage, you then give a competitive advantage, possibly in terms of price and access, to those who only paid the minimum wage. So you had to have a discussion about what was the better thing to achieve. And if the two had been very wide in terms of their where, where they were, I think it would have been impossible to require to move by statute to the living wage because they are so in real, close and real term. It struck us as a both a symbol about where you wanted to go and a practical issue about what is the real issue in Scotland uh, in terms of employ employment. It's, uh, uh, it's having a competitive uh, industries. It's having uh, issues so that uh, productivity is not affected and comp competition between uh, businesses is not inhibited by this. So that was our thinking. Maybe just adding one fundamental point, of course, that going back to the point I keep going back about skills and the relationship between skills and unemployment and indeed skills and wage levels. So I think if we can upskill our workforce, you could say from the bottom up, if you like, that indeed gives them more capacity to earn more money. And that's something I don't think we really are concentrating on. You could argue that we're, we're not focusing enough at the, the, the people we're talking about here and upskilling them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's like all the other debates we've had, I think, uh, in this session this morning. It's the holistic uh, linkage between devolved and reserved powers. Uh, and, of course, I would argue that without being able to make that linkage every day in terms of every policy, we are rather hamstrung and operate with our hands tied behind our back. Uh, and I guess in terms of the, the living wage, I mean, the point about the minimum wage not keeping up with inflation, I think, is very relevant to this debate. Uh, and also, I guess, in terms of, of this issue and, indeed, many of the issues raised in this, I think, very comprehensive report is that, that, that you have to look at the costs of not doing something, of not doing some of this, the cost to society as a whole, because if the trajectory is to increase in the way that we heard from the earlier session about impacts on deprived communities, the cost to society as a whole of not actually getting to grips with this problem, uh, I think would merit a, a study in, it, in itself. But uh, thank you very much. I won't detain the committee any longer. Thank you. Thanks, Fabio. Uh, Linda. Yeah, thank you very much. I want to keep in the theme of joining things up, um, but also, also talking about employers because I, I certainly don't think that we ever recognise enough just, just uh, what benefits small and medium enterprises have in local communities and, and the cohesion and, and, and well-being that can be there. Um, I noticed in the report, for example, that there was one of the paragraphs that talked about... Um, perhaps maintaining benefits into a length of employment, which I presume is about the unemployment trap, helping with that. And we also know that um, very often uh, there are incentives for employers to take on young people, apprentices, and, and all that kind of thing. But if we're so, really talking about joining things up, um, and I think this applies as well to sole trade or self-employed, as well as small and medium enterprises, anecdotally, um, I find in my constituency there's a real disconnect between the benefit system and um, employment law, for example, and how employers can act. And I very often come across um, employers who have said, you know, I'm having to pay people off. Uh, see if I could talk to the benefits office and come to some arrangement that they'd get help for a few weeks. They'd still have a job in a month's time because it's just a really difficult patch. I've heard um, self-employed people um, who give up being self-employed because that connection is not there that allows them to live day to day. And I wondered if that was something that you looked at, uh, the ability to 
not just include employers in employment initiatives, but include employers in the ability to keep people working and keep people employed uh, once they are already there, if it's the employer who hits a hard time. The labour market specialist we, uh, who came to give evidence was absolutely a critical role of employment was to retain people who may be not well at a particular time or having difficulties with some connection with the labour market, working part-time or having some time off to come back. And that's not unusual in a whole range of industries, but it, it is unusual in some of the small businesses because of their, as David says, they're, they're not well resourced in terms of human uh, resource, resource support. They don't understand a complex benefit system either. So they, they can, of course, do that. I, in, in, in my forward, I say independence will provide an opportunity to remove a series of disconnects between parts of the system which are currently reserved and those which aren't evolved. This gets to the heart of some of our discussions. We couldn't, we couldn't go to all the details which with, with should happen, but everybody we spoke to said, yes, you can make these better integrated. And part of the strong view that uh, certainly I have is this evidence about older men and older women being absent from the labour force. Less than half of women over 55 are in employment. Uh, extraordinary figures, uh, compared to kind of 80% uh, in other parts, of, 70 in other parts of Europe. They, that's a massive drag on our economy, not having the most active part of the labour force. Now, why is that? I don't know. I am not a labour force uh, uh, expert. But I know from uh, a whole range of people, you know, they have a huge range of skills, interpersonal skills and life experience to bring to them. So, again, we need to find why that is and bring employers into the point about maybe we can do something different. And what you were hearing before about where poverty was being concentrated, often poverty is concentrated in the older industry areas where older men in particular have come out of deindustrialization and not found a place in employment. Again, we have to be looking at that too. Now, that's beyond our remit, but we were quite clear that the opportunities for employment are not just about being passive in that area. The government has a role to play in, in particularly those two groups, older men and older women, and employers have a role to play. And if we're not careful, we'll confine this just to the private sector. Uh, Lynn's sector, you know, it's huge. The third sector these days is multi-billion uh, pound organisations in Scotland employing thousands and thousands of people. The demands about the living wage should apply to those. The demands about employability should apply to those. And they're kind of highly differentiated. So this is not a a, you know, a, you know, an issue pointed at one part of the, pri of the of the employment sector. It applies to all, including the public sector too, about what what they do. Um, but uh, it comes comes back to this. Yes, more connection with uh, the private sector, uh, the better we will unlock that, uh, that that social capital, which I think I saw so plainly uh, in all my discussions with them. Yeah. So, so I'm just to the point. I mean. Uh, it seems at the moment you almost get rewarded for being distant from the labour market, if you like. You have to be out of work for so long to get benefit. Now, that's exactly the wrong way around. And I think that may well be some of the reason that, because the longer you get out there, the less likely you are, as Martin highlighted, that age group to get back into it. Especially if we're not really focusing the skills. As, I, mean, I mean, I applaud the modern apprenticeships, but that's very much aimed at young people. It's not aimed at 50-plus-year-old men and women who need to be in support. So there's some challenges in that area. And absolutely, we shouldn't be rewarding people for being out of work. We should be working with the employers to try and perhaps subs you know, give them benefit them while they're actually in employment, having a difficult time for a period of months to make sure they don't leave the, the job market. Because there's no doubt there's a significant amount of evidence that getting back into it is harder. If you retain it there, you're also more likely to enhance your career and get better prospects as well. So that's an absolute challenge. I think you highlighted a very important issue there, actually. Yeah, just a final point, Convener. I'd like to go back to the... I, I know um, that all of you heard some of the evidence earlier from Sheffield Town University. Um, and just in conclusion, from my point of view, um, we know that it's clear the evidence is absolutely there that an independent Scotland could afford its own... Uh, system um, for uh, social security and I just would like your opinion as to whether in fact in so doing Scotland could in fact narrow that gap uh, between communities that very wide gap that is widening that we heard about earlier um, well I, firstly you're right we do conclude it's affordable 
we conclude there's a series of political decisions to be made about how you spend that money and what your policy objectives are. We set out what ours are. Part of those is we, we do say inequality is not just a moral issue, it's a drag on the economy. If you don't bring people in, actually, you actually spend more. So the preventative spend is there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very keen to emphasise that. The other thing I would, before Lynn comes in, just emphasise one thing. If we're not careful, this conversation about work really upsets some people who have a view about work is not the way out of poverty. I've tried to make it quite clear why we said that, but we recognise some will not find their route out. And that's why this, this view about looking about what we did with pensioners to then apply it to those who are long-term sick and disabled is a critical fairness issue. You can only do that if you build trust in the system. People are only willing to invest more if they think they've had a conversation about that and why we haven't tried other routes too. So that's the point I wanted to emphasise uh, at the moment. So, Lynn. Yeah, I think um, there are opportunities which independence would present, absolutely. However, um, you know, I think what, what struck me in all of this is, like, 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 to maybe to take a, a, a more balanced approach, is that the, the, there are issues with how devolution is operating and there's things perhaps we could do better. Um, there's things that we do very well. You know, things like Mention Community Jobs Scotland, for example, which is a fantastic programme. Okay, yes, the SCV will operate that, but it's a partnership which looks at getting people back into paid work. Um, so I think the main point for me is that our, our remit was around in the event of a yes vote, there are the opportunity to combine, look at employment law, benefits, employability, work support, and do things in a very different and a very more effective way. Um, what struck me in all of this work continually, both in phase one and phase two, from the evidence you as a committee have gathered, is this, is the type of inequalities we have will be there regardless of what happens in September. And if we, if, if we, we choose an action regardless of that result, then everybody loses. Um, so I think at the end of the day, this is people's lives we're talking about. And I think, you know, what happens in September is, is, is important. I and mean, we're in an important context just now where we're looking at these kind of issues perhaps more than we have in the past. So the, the, for me, the conclusion is inaction is, is not an option. So that, that, I think that's probably where I'd want to leave that, is yes, the, the, there's possibilities, but you know, let's, let's be honest about where we are as, an organ, as a country. Okay. Yeah, absolutely clear that my membership of the group does not mean that either myself or my organisation support independence or any other form of constitutional change. That's not our job, you know, business organisation, but I uh, make that absolutely clear. But absolutely, I think the point Millen made is, I think from an employer's point of view, a less complex fairer system is going to be better and that one that focuses on the individual is going to benefit the society and I hope that whatever happens in September, your work and our work will be taken forward by whoever's in power in this country and do something positive about it. It can only be a benefit to the individuals concerned who are currently suffering. So we need to do that. Um, that's the, the member of the committee finishes. Two technical questions that I just want to clarify uh, things on. In terms of the assessment of existing claimants, did you take into account um, existing benefits being retained for existing claimants in your analysis or um, what would the impact be of, of that? Has that been factored in? Um, our phase one of the group's report looked at this issue in terms of the transition and what we said was the, the primary focus in terms of delivery should be on the current claimants. They should not have their, their benefits disrupted through this period of transition. That was the most important thing that we, we said as number one in terms of the option appraisal. We said over a period of time there should be a dual, dual system. The Scottish Government responded to that by saying that would be a very short period of time. Uh, but there would be a, a system operated uh, between the UK Government and the Scottish Government, a two-year process, maximum, they said. So I hope that answers your question. There would be a period of time, mainly because without that focus uh, on, on the benefit, we would, we would disrupt people. We would, up, we would enlightenly make people concerned about the security of their benefit. And we all know that how important that is if you're on a very low income to have certainty about your benefits going to be coming through to you uh, whatever the change is taking place. And my final question, and the final question for this morning, um, the issue of affordability, I think you measured it in terms of GDP. Did you look at measuring affordability in terms of any other matrix? Uh, we, we looked at it in relative to GDP, yes. We looked at it in terms of uh, not just that's the kind of relative affordability. We looked at it, who, what do we in Scotland currently pay for? 
and what is the cost of that, and uh, we pay for what we get. So in terms of a simple affordability measure, there's no gap between what is raised in Scotland and then through the DWP pay back. Uh, so that was the simplest measure of uh, that. There was no gap. If we'd been looking at this in another jurisdiction of the United Kingdom we were, and we had found a gap, we would have had to say to you, yes, there's a gap here, which you're going to have to fill. So not only was it affordable in terms of GDP, that is more affordable in terms of percentage of GDP than the UK, more affordable in a significant number of uh, OECD countries and European countries, importantly, it was also currently affordable because it was paid for by Scottish taxpayers uh, and therefore all those three men mean that we kind of moved on from that relatively quickly, although I must say we did have somebody from the Institute of Fiscal Studies on our group and they went, uh, Mike went through all our figures, so I'm quite certain we got that um, really clearly right. Yeah. That's really helpful yeah, to understand. Fine. I think the issue, again, going back to a point we made earlier on, is, and I think point one of the committee members made was, I think the issue of affordability is around uh, not doing something and not changing what's there already is that it's far too costly, both in terms of personal cost, but also to the state that we have a system which is so complex and bureaucratic that actually um, disempowers people. And so I think the issue of affordability is much wider than that, is that investing in a good system makes good economic sense. Well, on behalf of the committee, can I thank you for, first of all, your evidence uh, this morning, but secondly, for the effort and the work that you put into producing this report, which I think is whether uh, we agree with the idea of independence or not, is all, is all thinking about just how we should look at this in the, the future, because I think there is general agreement that the status quo is not an option. Um, and I think there is widespread acceptance that that's, that's the point. And, and your contribution to uh, that thinking is obviously uh, in your, your work, and it's been very valuable. So thank you very much. OK. I'll suspend the meeting again for a few minutes to <laughs> how do you start to...
again. Our fourth item of business today is consideration of the disabled persons' badges of motor vehicles, Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014. This instrument was considered by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee at its meeting on the 10th of June. The committee did not draw the attention of the Parliament to the instrument on any grounds within its remit. This morning, to consider the instrument, we are joined by Stuart Fubister, Divisional Solicitor of the Legal Directorate, Graeme Thompson, Transport Accessibility and Road Safety Team Leader, Transport Policy Directorate, and David Jamieson, Blue Badge Policy Officer of the Scottish Government. I invite members to ask any questions they might have on the instrument. Um, Linda, I think you'd indicated you may want. Uh, well, I do. Yeah, it's um, a, a wee bit wider than that, actually, and I would appreciate your, your view on it. It's a constituency query and uh, one which was also submitted to our Your Say session convener, um, but the lady wasn't able to come along. It's a very simple question about blue badges. It's the idea of um, the potential of a duplicate blue badge, and it's, it's a very straightforward situation. The lady has a blue badge um, disability car. Uh, she's completely incapacitated and can't drive at the moment um, because of uh, advanced uh, problems and therefore has to take her blue badge out of her car to put in her family or friend's car who drives her to hospital. Therefore, her original car is uh, badly parked and uh, liable to end up with a fine or something because of this. Um, and I just wondered, one whether you had looked at the potential of duplicate blue badges for specific circumstances, to whether this was in fact something that could be at the discretion of the local authority, would there be anything to stop the local authority making the odd exception in cases like this to be helpful? Over here, gentlemen. Um, just as a, a general <laughs> starting point, uh, the, the regulations and scheme uh, just how they're worded, they actually they do limit a, a single badge to a person. Um, so it's not something that I think has been thought about doing in terms of duplicate badges, uh, per se. And um, you know, some of the reasons I think probably why that's the case is just the, a desire generally just to keep the number of badges in circulation to the not a minimum, but just to the to the need. So a badge is given to the individual, um, not to a particular vehicle. So I guess that's the general reason why it is just the single badge to a person. Um, yeah, I think that um, the local the local authority, because the regulations state that way, the local authority doesn't have the discretion um, to uh, necessarily apply. I think that the the overall blue badge scheme overall is designed to um, um, protect the, the give the individual a right to uh, a, a blue badge and for a if you were to duplicate uh, give duplicate blue badges there would be a concern that say two badges could get used at once um, and uh, that, that would be a concern overall so therefore it's not something that we have looked at uh, certainly um, recently anyway I'm not saying it's never been looked at. Can I just say, convener, um, I get that, you know, the, the idea of trying to limit fraud, and it's perfectly acceptable, but it seems to me that, um, you know, there are always things which come up which are absolute genuine exceptions, and it's all very well having the right to a blue badge, but it seems to be you don't have the right to, uh, you know, if you become so that you can't actually use your own car and you have to take your badge away, um, because you happen to have a stookie on or something and can't drive, that uh, uh, seems a bit harsh. Um, and I wonder if you could perhaps have a, have a think about that. I'm not asking you to change the legislation, because I get that, but it bothers me that there, there is no um, discretion at all that can be applied to the local authority. Um, if it's not about giving a duplicate blue badge, I wonder if you could have a think and perhaps get back to me um, about what could possibly be done in this case, because it does seem to be penalising someone unduly. Certainly if there's um, a particular response to the year, say, um, that, that's been brought to your attention, particular circumstances, I'd be more than happy to look at those particular circumstances. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Ken and then Annabelle, quickly, please. Thanks. Just to go over the numbers here, um, can you tell me, I was just trying to look at the impact assessment to see how many people will be affected, make sure I've got these numbers right. Roughly 100,000 people... Um, are entitled to the uh, current DLA mobility component. 60% of those, is that right? 
60,000 people, in other words, qualify for a blue badge, or, or, or uh, sorry, take up a blue badge because they've got a car. Generally. And you're expecting 20% of those to lose that right under the new assessment, the transfer into PIP. 20%? 12,000 people. Uh, Department for Works and Pensions, its estimate is, is roughly a 20% reduction across yeah. all awards. So, so, so yeah. rough, roughly 12,000 people in Scotland will lose their blue badge. That's roughly what I'm... 100,000, 60% would be 60,000, so 20% of 60,000 would be 12,000. That's my arithmetic. <laughs> that, that, that's that's their, right your arithmetic seems sound. And of those, um, how many will... Uh, they'll be losing it, but they'll be automatically... They should have been uh, entitled to a lifetime badge. How many of... Are they part of that 12,000? Are they part of the 20% that are losing, or are actually they part of the 48,000 that are continuing? Okay. Um... I guess it's probably easier just to look at the 60,000 figure. And we, we don't know how the provisions in these regulations would actually impact specifically against those who are perhaps expected to receive decreased awards when they reassess for PIP or if they receive no award under PIP. But going from that 60,000 figure, um, all of those who have an indefinite uh, award would be able to continue to passport. And then the second provision is all who have got a fixed um, term, higher rate mobility component daily award would, uh, if they were disputing their PIP decision, once it comes through, then they would have recourse to further blue badge for a period of time as they challenge that decision. So the, the, the two new criteria, they do, in effect, they should capture everybody within that 60,000 figure to some extent, or the vast majority of which, um, anyway. If, so that's the... Well, the, the, the way I was thinking that those who should, should, should have qualified originally for a lifetime award will actually be a part of the 48,000, because they're still... The, the reason that they qualified in the first place will still apply. I can't imagine they'll be downgraded in terms of the PIP assessment. However, I'd have thought that those... This also covers those who are going to appeal their downgrade. So that'll be the 12,000. Now, the point is that... It, you, is that right? And this, this is the way I'm thinking of it. So the, of the 12, basically 12,000 people are going to lose their blue badge. If they appeal their downgrade under, under uh, DLA to PIP, while they're appealing, they can keep their blue badge. If their appeal is unsuccessful or after a year, that will expire and they will lose their blue badge. Is that right? Right. right. Did, did, can I ask, did the government look, I'm not sure if you can answer this, did the government look at just allowing those who currently had a blue badge to continue to keep the blue badge? Uh, the, the people that currently have a blue badge are entitled, under the regulations we put in last year, to keep that badge until expiry. So that that's uh, generally three years that they would, uh, or up to three years that they would have. Of the people that are um, losing their badge now, we don't have exact we don't have exact figures which say th uh, this percentage, but we reckon that the DWP estimates are that approximately seventy percent of people are on. A lifetime or indefinite awards, mm -hmm. and that we're talking about 30% of people being on um, fixed fixed term awards. So it's those 30% that we're talking about uh, protecting from the um, uh, giving the appeal. Some of those, after the year, will uh, will uh, lose their their entitlement um, uh, if if the appeal and their appeal is unsuccessful mm -hmm. uh, against that award, um, but uh, um, we didn't uh, we we weren't able to consider um, keeping the, those people on indefinitely. So those thirty percent, we couldn't consider keeping those on indefinitely because of those thirty percent, there'll be some that quite legitimately lose their award. Mm -hmm. There's thirty percent are fixed term. They're fixed term for a reason because their condition may fluctuate. It may change. So, therefore, we couldn't, uh, couldn't see giving it right. to So, you, you didn't look at it. So, basically, uh, if, they, if they're unsuccessful on appeal, they will lose their blue badge. Can I just uh, double-check one other thing? What's happening with bus passes? Is, is, there, is that being dealt with, uh, the concessionary travel, is that being dealt with a separate regulation altogether? As, uh, it, this isn't part of the scope of this, uh, no, the, this work, um, but um, uh, we're not uh, aware of anything uh, getting taken forward on concessionary travel. Um, necessarily, the circumstances around concessionary travel are, are different, um, uh, and what was put in last year was um, was more um, 
gave broader pr provision than the blue badge things. So essentially, with the blue badge, we wanted to try and capture. We 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 got the scheme, the the passporting and non passporting benefits, uh, ensured parity, and we ensured parity as far as we could between DLA and PIP uh, last year. This is going uh, so that was for essentially new applicants to the blue badge scheme. What we're doing now is uh, trying to cover all the people that, that are Transition. existing existing um, badge holders as much as we can. Thanks very much. Thank you. I wonder you want to come in about first Please, just back on what I was talking about earlier. It just struck me that the legislation which allows local authorities to issue blue badges in the first place to people, I just wondered what level of discretion there was in there for local authorities in terms of who gets issued with a blue badge and whether, in fact, something could be done there in terms of discretion for duplicates. Um, I guess the, the, the eligibility criteria are quite, is quite clearly put in, in the regulations and, to a large extent, they, they, they need to follow that when they're making decisions, the local authorities follow it when they're making decisions as to entitlement. Um, it is, of course, always the responsibility of the local authorities to interpret what the meaning of those eligibility criteria, how they're read, um, and then to apply them to their local circumstance, really, to, to assess. I just so, wondered if they could have that discretion under that regulation. You wouldn't need to bother running away and worrying about it for this time around. There, the, we... we in addition to um, the regulations, which are, when it comes to eligibility, fairly um, uh, fairly clear um, what, 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 what they should do, mm -hmm. we do publish a, an extensive code of practice that the, the local authorities um, follow and indicate that they want to, to follow in the vast mm -hmm. majority mm -hmm. of cases. There are occasionally times where... Um, um, where we have um, uh, discussion groups with the local authorities. In fact, we had blue badge workshops with the local authorities earlier in the year where mm -hmm. we discussed um, eligibility uh, in, in the round. And the, uh, the, the, while they, they essentially use the code of practice and they use the regulations to say, OK, these are the standards that we've mm -hmm. got, and therefore they do have some flexibility as long as they do it within the, uh, the, the regulations. Sorry, I realise I'm not answering it. <laughs> the very civil service speak that one. Yes, okay. absolutely. Thank you for that. Okay. Annabelle, yeah, maybe. Yeah, on that point, I mean, I, I, I just want to go back briefly to the issue of discretion. I mean, I, I would have thought, but I may be wrong, uh, that the local authority uh, must implement what is set forth in the various SSIs. But if it wished to go further, uh, it would not be prevented by the SSI from doing so. And that, I've been trying to get to the nub of that for a while because I have a particular constituent case. Um, uh, and uh, I don't know if you can really provide a definitive response uh, today. And I wonder, looking then at the blue bad, at, at the uh, concessionary travel, if uh, the same would apply or would something different apply? And those are the two questions I have. If there's no clear-cut definitive response today, it would be helpful if some guidance could be given to the committee because these are kind of issues that do come up quite a, a lot, you know, where somebody falls within a, a, a sort of grey area, mm. what happens to them, and it's certainly something I've received correspondence about. So. Local authorities can't issue a badge or a travel permit to someone who isn't eligible in terms of the regulations. They have to fit in. Obviously, the categories of um, passported benefits are only part of the story, the mobility assessments and things like that. But local authority has no discretion to go beyond um, if someone doesn't fit within an eligible category, then a badge can't be given. There is always the, the other route that, that people can apply for. So, um, as Stuart indicated there, that people um, people can apply through a mobility assessment, and ultimately that's where local authorities have, have discretion because they are the people that are conducting those independent mobility assessments, and they are having to make a judgment there. Yes, there are. Um, we put in uh, guidance as to how those should uh, should go, but ultimately there's a judgment call as to whether someone gets a, a blue badge where they go through those criteria. Uh, where they go through that um, non-passported route when they make the application direct to the local authority. Okay, thank you. Okay, finally, Jamie. 
Yes, just a quick question, Convener. Under the current system, we, or the, the system has, has been, uh, where a person lost their uh, entitlement DLA or that entitlement was changed, uh, would they uh, have, uh, and they lose the right to passport on to, uh, uh, to qualify for a blue badge, do they lose that right immediately? The, the existing badge runs to its expiry date. Yes. That's what was in the regulations we put in last year. Uh -huh. So even if you lose the, the, if you're not eligible in benefit terms, your badge still runs on to its expiry date. Sorry, I, I, maybe I'm not making myself clear. So let's say we've reached a stage where the badge has expired and your circumstances are now such under the scheme as was, you, you lose your type of DLA or it's downgraded and you're no longer pass, allowed to qualify for the blue badge under passporting arrangements, do you lose that blue badge immediately? If it's expired, it's no longer valid. You, you, you have to apply for a new one. And the test is whether you're eligible at the point of application. Um, and likewise, if you're one of the categories we're putting in just now, if you'd appealed the decision that takes you out of eligibility, that, if you like, creates an interim eligibility for another badge uh -huh. while the appeal is running. Under the current system? That's what this instrument that we're looking at today is, is putting in. Yeah. I, yes, I'm aware of that. I'm trying to ask what is it. I'm coming on to that in a minute. Uh, if I'm uh, asking what the system is as is now. So do you have the interim uh, uh, passport entitlement if you seek to appeal a decision? No. Not no. Either. So essentially what mechanism you're putting in, the government, the Scottish Government seeking to put in place now is an improvement to the current system. Because if someone's appealing, they are now entitled to a year's stay of execution, is it? It's a new development taking account of the new benefits system, the personal independence payment. Yeah. And at the moment, if you're appealing, you, 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 you don't have that right. Thank you. Yeah. As far as I'm aware, the, this is responding to a, a suggestion we made uh, from this committee. So, yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs> Okay. I think we've exhausted the, the questions, so um, I am now invite members to agree to note the regulations. Yes. Agreed. Well, given that we suggested them, I think that's a very good <laughs> idea. Okay, can I thank you gentlemen for coming this morning and answering the questions. Thanks a lot. Our fifth item this morning, our next item of business, is a report back on a visit that Linda Fabiani, Alex Johnson and Ken McIntosh conducted to Glasgow Department of Work and Pension Service Centre on the 3rd of June to examine the operation of practice of universal credit in Scotland. I will invite Alec to give a short summary of the visit. I will try and keep it very short, Convener. Uh, the committee met uh, in Glasgow with uh, Mike Baker, Operations Director of Universal Credit across the UK, uh, and his team. Uh, and that included the manager of the Glasgow Service Centre, Moira Watson. Uh, we took the opportunity to discuss with them uh, the implementation process uh, and to get some uh, first-hand experience and meet some of the people who were involved in that process. They highlighted to us that the management team felt that the universal credit was a better system than the legacy one uh, and that claimants were finding, it, uh, finding work easier uh, and faster. Of course, this only applies to those who have access to universal credit, that is, single people in the specific areas in which the, it has been rolled out. And it was explained to us that rollout had been cautious to allow the DWP to learn many lessons from the early implementation. He mentioned that 800 issues had been flagged up through their feedback loops uh, and that these were being dealt with. Uh, we uh, also had the opportunity to meet staff from the Inverness office uh, who had been involved in uh, implementing the pilot there. They took the view that universal credit was easier to operate than the legacy systems. The focus was more on employment. The fact that claimants did not need to move between benefits anymore uh, was seen as a major advantage by them, uh, as was the existence of the single phone number contact. The majority of claimants, 80%, uh, had completed their claims online without assistance, although assistance is available uh, at the job centre. Uh, this was much higher rate than anticipated. 
Uh, other issues that emerged in the final session included the fact that universal credit uh, may be more expensive to administer than legacy systems uh, because of the coaching costs, but it's hoped that this might make savings uh, during the, uh, through the administration of the, the new benefit. The switch from paper to digital uh, makes the system much faster. The initial estimate uh, available online of when claims will be paid and how much is likely to be paid uh, is very popular. Staff who previously only handled phone calls uh, now process applications online and vice versa. Uh, operating with housing benefit and social landlords is a new area of activity for the DWP, but uh, we spoke to individuals who uh, were uh, engaged in that process. There's also been a lower level of complaints than initially expected, given that uh, claimants uh, are required to devote 35 hours a week to job, the job search process. However, there are there do not yet seem to be any uh, public data on consumer satisfaction. However, the opportunity was uh, welcome to actually talk to people who were sitting at the desks uh, dealing with uh, claims in real time. Uh, and the indication is that the individuals themselves who are working within the DWP are actually finding this uh, a system that is uh, flexible uh, and allows them, uh, in their view, to do their job effectively. Yeah. That's really helpful, Alex. Is there any of the other members who were on the visit have a point, Linda? Um, I'd just like, like to add, first of all, that um, I was very, very impressed by the commitment shown by the staff uh, in Glasgow in, in their view that they wanted to assist people. Um, and I think that was very, very marked. Um, uh, there's nothing I can disagree with from what Alex said. Um, the one caveat I would put is that we should bear in mind that this is a single person only pilot, and I think it'll be much more complicated when it starts to affect folk well, beyond we that. Through an example where it had started with a single person and it got more and more complicated. <laughs> yeah, there was a dog involved, I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <Say no more. laughs> No, just to echo that point, I think that uh, given the uh, public concern that's been raised about the role of the universal credit, I think that we're all um, struck by how welcoming this, this is the staff perspective. Yeah. This is not the recipients. This is the, the people running the system. I think we're all struck by how uh, enthusiastic, actually, they were about it, about the potential for improvement. At the same time, we're very conscious these are all young male, mostly, I think. Weren't they mm -hmm. mostly... I got the impression there were more men than women, but certainly all young single people. Uh, the claimants. The claimants, The yes. claimants, not yes. the staff. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> the claimants, not the staff. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure it's a... It's difficult to, to jump to any conclusions from it. Um, but it was quite clear, and, and it is a, a complex system. I mean, it's got a live interaction with the tax, with the HMRC mm -hmm. web, website, mm -hmm. so, which is um, very good, very useful. It allows them to make this initial estimate of how much they're going to receive, which I think the, the claimants themselves find very useful. Um, and we were also struck by the low level of complaints about it. Again, I think because people are told the figure quite clearly, quite early on, an indicative figure, not the exact figure, an indicative figure. So some of the benefits were obvious from this. The complications, um, I think, we'll see as it, as it, as it rolls out. Mm -hmm. It is all helpful. I mean, it keeps building up a picture of, of mm -hmm. this uh, system. So thanks to the members mm -hmm. for coming out and giving us a, a comprehensive report, which, again, we'll, we'll keep an eye on as we move forward. Uh, as we agreed at the start of the meeting, uh, that's all of our agenda items that have been taken in public, and we now move into private session. Thank you.